think we have a pretty tight schedule, so let's get going. Um, yeah, thank you for coming again today. Also nice to see some new faces today. Uh, I think we are heading for uh, quite an interesting day, uh, both with regards to presentations, but uh, also some uh, demos later today. So I'm, at least I'm looking forward to, to uh, this day here. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I think we should just get going. Yes, and uh, good morning for me also. Uh, as yesterday, I'll be in charge of keeping time. Um, and I'll also introduce, and I will start to introduce the first speaker, uh, Mr. Matthias Usler from Office, uh, German Science Research Institute in, in Altenburg. So yep. the floor is yours, and welcome. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present you today in the morning a bit of uh, results from a study uh, we did for the uh, German Ministry of Economics and Energy uh, during the last two years, which uh, mainly deal with, is there some kind of way of skipping my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll just keep going. Um, and uh, I'm going to present you the key results. Normally we have to talk about this study for like three hours, which is more detail, of course, but uh, for you, I skipped some regulatory issues which are probably out of scope for Denmark anyway. And uh, I'll just tell you the main results we had from certain uh, technologies we, uh, we analyzed actually within the scope of this presentation. Uh, so usually at, at Germany, it's always, uh, we need another study. So uh, we started out and uh, the, uh, we, we kicked off to do this study in 2010. So that was like uh, where, where all German um, municipal utilities and the large TSOs and DSOs and the regulator and uh, the ministry actually agreed that they need something like a study on how to cope with the uh, higher penetration of DER in the distribution grid. And then it, it, it took some time and we already had a kickoff for this study and then it was postponed at the day of the kickoff because the uh, uh, a German company dealing with ICT uh, in telecommunications, it might have been the German Telecom, uh, just skipped and didn't want to do the project. So uh, it, it took some time. Um, and after, well, a, a lot of issues, uh, we, we were really like, we are, oh, come on, we just want to do it. And we are more or less creating the Tower of Babel, putting stuff on, on top again and again and again, and creating stuff which might break sometime. Uh, but, but after a, a lot of discussions, uh, we've, we finally got to do this study. And what I'm going to present you in, in five more or less short blocks, and I already, normally I, I plan for some discussion afterwards, but well, it depends on the time and how much I'm going to talk and how fast, of course. Um, I'm just telling you the, the key facts in, in part A. So uh, you all know probably German Energiewende, so it has already been an American word, as I was told last week. Um, we, we have to cope uh, in, in terms of, of grid extension and grid planning uh, with the overall arching aims of uh, putting more uh, peak, peak generation. And uh, this usually creates on average like 25% of all electricity we have. Um, it's likely to increase to up to 50% in 2030 and up to 80 envisioned percent, of course, since we never know what's going to happen between now and 2050. Um, we uh, did the study alongside, uh, alongside two partners, so Office, the Oldenburger Forschungs- und Entwicklungsinstitut für Informatik, Werkzeuge und Systeme, so this is why we abbreviate that. Uh, we did that along uh, the WTH Aachen uh, with Professor Moser as a chair and uh, eBridge Consulting, which are more or less uh, responsible for the regulatory issues in terms of our study. So uh, finally, after some time, and hope and prayers we were given this study. Um, the focus was actually different than the studies you probably know from German DENA, um, because we also had in mind that we wanted to, to use new technologies and new control strategies and incorporate them already at planning time for the distribution grid. So our focus was how can we take 
ICT and more intelligent stuff from operations time also into account at planning time of the grid uh, in order just to, to lower the investment cost we actually have on the grid. Um, so main focus, how to develop our German grids with having ICT and conventional ways as a comparison in mind. So we also had to look for 2030 and 2050 in terms of how the business as usual extension of the German grid would be if we still aim for the DER uh, goals we had in mind in terms of the regulator and in terms of the politics. Um, also, we had to do a cost-benefit analysis of all the intelligence staff and all the ICT part we had. And we were also given the right that we might address regulatory issues and problems which might arise if our solution should be put into practice uh, but is not fitting the conventional ways of regulation. So this is uh, a part I'm going to talk a bit less about. If someone's interested in how ICT for smart grids impacts German regulation, then we can talk afterwards. So I'm, I'm here full day. Um, that, that might be something which is not the that interesting in terms uh, of, of the technical analysis. Uh, so, main issues we have to do. If there's something red, then it's always about ICT. So, because we're from a research institute in computer science, I always highlight the parts you can ask more about later in the discussion. Um, so, how much grid extension or extension planning is actually needed when you take uh, conventional measures into account? So. Uh, how, is, how is it distributed? Uh, is there a density function where you have more type of grids which shall be extended because they are either in a particular region or they have a particular structure already in place? Uh, we also had to deal with uh, which planning strategies shall be applied when you use ICT-based or more like ICT-related smart grid technologies. Um, how can you lower the integration cost of this new technology with the existing legacy infrastructure? Um, also, which ICT technology shall be used to change the conventional planning? This is what I already mentioned. Which impacts are induced on the security of supply and, of course, by more ICT interfaces? Because uh, politics in German always say if you introduce more ICT, everyone knows it's going to be more vulnerable. Of course, that's not always true, uh, but people think this way. So, if, uh, generally, the complexity, of course, rises as you've got more systems. Uh, if you've got need more backup systems, if you have more interfaces, there are, there's more room for errors to uh, actually occur. Uh, but still, uh, you might take uh, risk management and different uh, variations of technologies into account to deal with this very issue. Uh, and the fourth question was actually, how must the regulation change in the light of the me measures we propose within the study? So, I'm going now to talk to you a bit about the assumptions we had to make, because as Tom Cruise uh, did on the second slide, we cannot hang from the ceiling and just change the complete grid. We had to do some assumptions not to, to do something which is really impossible. Um, so uh, one assumption we have is 90% of all distributed energy are in the so-called distribution grid, in German for tile nets. Uh, so for, for distribution grid, we took this gray, blue shaded stuff uh, and I put in like some figures we have around for Germany, so because that, that might be interesting for you. So we start off with the uh, connection to the UCTE grid, and um, we have a lot of, uh, we have, of course, in, in terms of absolute numbers of offshore wind parks, we have like 15, but they only produce like uh, 0.86 gigawatt of power uh, compared to the conventional large. Uh, generation plants with uh, 73 gigawatts of power. Uh, from high voltage, uh, highest voltage to high voltage, we have like 800 substations we have to deal with. And then there's the interesting part in terms of all the loads and all the distributed energy resources feeding into the grid. Uh, so high voltage grids, we have around 100 different grids with 95,000 kilometers. For medium, we have 4,500 grids with uh, 0.5 million kilometers. And for lower voltage, we have 1.1 million kilometers and like half a million grids. So that's complicated. And uh, those half million grids and uh, also those uh, 4,500 uh, 4, grids are merely operated by like 880 uh, DSOs. So that's uh, like the figures we have to deal with. Uh, in terms of the generation, uh, solar parks at high voltage, there's very little. So we got like 2.3 gigawatts. Uh, we got 14 gigawatts power at high voltage level in terms of wind parks. So uh, 
also it, it grows on a medium voltage level, so we will see the figures rising, but the gigawatt power doesn't really rise, so we got like uh, 12,500 wind parks and 15.6 uh, gigawatts of power generation uh, connected to the medium voltage grid. Uh, also 40,000 uh, solar parks, or sometimes it's more like uh, PV panels uh, with, with some kind of aggregator function and 10.1 uh, gigawatts of power. And in low voltage, where, the, where there's virtually no sensors or RTUs or information about the grid at all, we got like 1.2 million solar uh, PV panels, which feed in 19 gigawatts of power, and we got like uh, half a million voltage transformers. So that's perhaps an impressive figure, but uh, well, we had to deal with that, and also in terms of the simulation we had to do, that took some time for the colleagues from Aachen. And um, so we had to come up with a method, of course. So our method actually was like, we, we did like five steps. Uh, in this talk, I can't really dig deep into uh, the, the uh, parts two and three and four, because that's like a lot of uh, simulation stuff and a lot of how to, uh, how to create this, this model archetype uh, grids in terms of MV and LV we had in mind. Uh, so basically, um, I'm going to talk about part one and five in this talk. So first stop we had to, uh, first step we had to take was actually clustering our German grids. So we had the figures from the previous slides, and then we we know that we, we uh, that it's it's not based uh, on the individual member states in Germany, but it's more like based on some kind of density function, some kind of industrial load, some kind of weather conditions, climate conditions, some kind of HV grid model. Uh, so we clustered basically with the colleagues from Aachen uh, for load, uh, DER generation capacity, and the envisioned planning already in place from the uh, German Nets Entwicklungsplan, so the grid uh, development plan. Um, the second one was actually those heterogeneous grids uh, had to be modeled somehow in, in some kind of archetype model grids. Uh, so we developed typical uh, MV and LV grids, and uh, for HV we had like a, a German model we constructed from, honestly it was constructed from Google Maps, uh, and then we, we asked back uh, to, to the uh, UCTE for some uh, individual electrotechnical uh, properties. Uh, the third way was actually then dealing with the individual scenarios. So uh, if you got like your, your certain archetype grid, then it's not easy for each model grid to integrate the same number of renewables. So we had to, to cope with different paths of DR into integration into those grids in terms of the development over time and where it can be connected. Uh, and then actually there were simulations, simulations, simulations. Uh, so the colleagues from Aachen, they went to the University of Aachen Supercluster and rented them for some month, and uh, they even cheated them into buying more uh, computers for them. And uh, actually then we had like the figures in terms of the conventional grid planning we needed. Uh, and then there was the interesting part where we came up uh, with the aggregation of the results and also put in our extra intelligence we had in mind when we wanted to cope better with the uh, DR integration in the distribution grid. Uh, so basically, current grids, so the, the conventional planning is, is, is based on, on the models. Uh, we had for, for load and feed-in and generation of DR classes, we had 10 classes for LV, uh, mainly based on load and PV feed-in. Uh, for medium voltage, we had like eight classes based on a fit-in of uh, wind power plants and PV power plants. Uh, distribution analysis was mainly done in terms of load generation, uh, existing cables, and the length of the radial feeders we had to take into account. And that led like to a clustering of DSO in, in LV, uh, having this figure, so with all those DSOs here, namely, so you see that it's it's quite rough uh, in terms of the distribution. You cannot really see a pattern or, or a heavy cluster. That's also true for medium voltage, where we have like uh, this uh, class taxonomy in place. Um, honestly, it was like quite a bit tricky to get all the data into place because we had to deal with uh, a lot of data sources, and usually there were not consistency or checked for 
uh, inconsistency up front. So we, we dealt with the uh, German Renewable Energy Registry, which exists for all the uh, existing DR resources uh, and wind parks and so on. Uh, we had for the HV grid, we had some public TSO data available. Uh, and then we found out, okay, we have to go into consultation process with the individual DSOs and TSOs in Germany. And we made like a questionnaire and really grabbed a lot of data from them and asked them to fill out that in order to make our simulations and our knowledge about the grids we had to model actually a lot better. So that took some time and uh, uh, it's, it's always, uh, and we had some, they really trusted us, which was nice because usually they go, don't give away that much information about uh, their individual uh, MV and LV grids. Uh, so, the main changes to 2030 to we envisioned or we saw was like, like we have a double of DR uh, peak uh, generation. So um, in Germany, it's always about scenarios. So it's in a given the scenario one, it's uh, uh, no nuclear, no coal, uh, charcoal fired plants and so on. So um, we had to cope with existing studies already from, uh, from DENA or in place from the Ministry of Economics. And uh, then actually we picked some scenarios and we didn't choose one. So our study is also compliant finding uh, existing ways to cope with all existing studies and all existing scenarios. So we have the renewable energy 2014 scenario uh, where the German government says we want to double the penetration of DER into the grid until 2032. That's an average 4% per year we have to cope with. So there's the uh, Netzentwicklungsplan, the NEP. Uh, NEP actually means in German cheating, uh, because then it's always funny if you say that, because it, it's a TSO scenario, and people always think the TSOs want to cheat on them. Um, they, they have quite the same figures, so they have an additional 5% uh, per year in terms of the DER capacity uh, feeding into the grid. And then there's the stuff in Germany, we call it federalism. Uh, which means at every member state of Germany may do as it, as it just wants to do. So that's the Bundesländer scenario, and we always we call it the triplet scenario, because everyone wants to have something from the DR. So uh, we we also uh, our our member state is also doing a lot of DR. No, we are even doing more DR. No, we have more PVR, but we have wind parks. So everyone wants something, and this is when when you have like an additional. Three point, so that's bun if you if you go for federalism, then the government it's it's easy to to reach the goal, um, but that actually means like an additional ten percent per year in terms of the DR growth of the uh, the existing capacity feeding into the German grid, which is of course a problem from the grid wise perspective. Um, so we have regional differences. I cannot dig deep into all those individual figures. Um, but actually, what you have to say in terms of the results, 75% uh, of all 888 uh, German DSOs face changes. Um, only 5% of them really have massive impact on their grid, uh, but they are then just really massively impacted, which means actually like they have to extend their existing grid uh, of up to 80% in the next 10 years, which is awkward. Um, and uh, we have some clusters, of course, uh, for the distribution in the scenario. So, of course, having uh, offshore wind parks, and uh, if you're dealing with hmm, where does actually the wind blow, so it might be the coast, uh, you have more extension in the north, whereas we always have in the south of Germany or in the western part the individual high industrial loads. Um, there are some differences between the scenarios. So, uh, for example, in the Bundesländer scenario, in the federalism scenario, um, we have more growth in the West because North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany says we got a different uh, DER strategy and renewable energy strategy and we have impressive goals to be achieved by our uh, minister uh, president. And uh, well, that differs. So you, you see that of course this is triple the capacity, uh, some differences on where you have the feed in but the general story is always the same. So if you just narrow it down to the, to the overall arcing problem, then you see that uh, you can cope with all those scenarios in the pretty same way. Uh, of course, allocation and uh, impact on different uh, voltage levels sometimes differ. So now I come into the original way of business as usual planning for the German 
uh, distribution grid. So uh, in Germany, we plan for the DER generation peak. And of course, the maximum peak fed in is in taken into account and uh, the lowest annual load in terms of, so the, the highest load is taken into account, but you then take the lowest limit in terms of the grid extension. So it's probably a situation which never occurs. Uh, because you, uh, if, if you have like the lowest load, then you may not have the highest feed in. And of course, you may not have the highest thermal limits of your lines. So it's like you have some degrees of freedom, but they are all on, on a certain limit. Uh, and we tried, okay, how do we cope with that? So perhaps we can lower some kind of assumptions there. Um, it's really focusing the existing planning state of the art on non-existing use cases. Um, so the reduction by load management is not taken into account for the planning phase. So everyone knows you, do, you can do that at one time, uh, but you do not take that into account at planning time, which is of course a problem if you always plan for the DER peak. Um, and in Germany, when you connect like a small PV panel to the grid, you can choose between uh, people putting you into energy management systems and direct uh, uh, feed-in control or direct generation control. Uh, on the other hand, you can say, uh, I, I don't need ICT technologies, just cut me to 70% of my nominative uh, maximum feed-in capacity uh, in a fixed way. So it sounds a bit weird if you've got like a 10, uh, 10 kV PV panel and you say, oh, come on, if you want to connect it to the grid, it's 7 kV max. But, well, this is how the German regulator envisioned some, some parts. Um, and we also thought, well, perhaps we, we might play around with that for the future uh, DR feeding into the grid. Uh, of course, we took all the technical grid-related issues into account, so all the thermal limits and all the voltage regulation uh, and voltage band problems. Um, and then we did like all the simulations. We, we made the conventional planning, and uh, if there's some violation of the technical issues or technical limits we had, uh, then we, we said, okay, this scenario way that doesn't work, we cut this tree in terms of our simulations and start with a different way uh, until it fulfills the uh, technical limits again. So we only had valid technical scenarios in the overall uh, simulation at the very end. So for conventional planning, and those are the figures you have to remember, um, till 2050 or 2030 uh, on its way, uh, we need a lot of new lines in Germany if we do business as usual. So we need, in terms of the scenarios, between 50,000 to 120,000 kilometers in the low voltage grid, which marks up to 10%. Uh, we need like 70,000 to 140,000 in the medium voltage grid, that's an impressive 27%, and uh, 10,000 to 22,000 kilometer in HV level, which is roughly up to 24%. So that means an investment of 23.2 billion euro uh, and or 50 billion euro in the Bundesländer scenario where people do everything they want to do. Uh, if you, I, I think the, I was looking at the ratio of uh, Danish kroners versus euros and I think it's uh, times seven as far as I remember. So that's perhaps an impressive amount of money. Um, 7.5, it's even worse, okay, so that's, I mean, that's anyway, if it's 7.5 or like 7, that doesn't care, so it's too much. Uh, so the, two th and the problem is two-thirds are actually on HV level, uh, and this is 30% of all those investments needed. Uh, so if you, if you look at the figures, then you see that, okay, this is, this is HV and HV using earth cables. So in Germany, it's always, if you buy a bit like a high voltage line, you run into problems because there are people living in Germany and uh, they got like the strong knock, not in my backyard feeling. They want renewable energies, but pretty much not in their fucking backyard. So no wind power plants and those PV sh shiny panels, we don't want them, but I want renewable energy and dropping out of nuclear. So uh, that's the NIMBY problem and that's a big, big problem. So we have to dig deep and always also put the HV cables into Earth. And you see um, that's, that gray shaded stuff, it's more and more and more costly, but that, that's because it's Germany. Um, well, so this is too expensive. And also we have a timing issues because 70% of all extensions would be needed within the next 30 years. Uh, I'll just check the time, not to run out of time and to postpone the whole event. Uh, 
so you see that it, it decreases over the time, but we have a high ramp up, which is a big problem because actually German utilities are not so well off nowadays. Uh, and of course we have uh, ex the, the grid extension and expansion planning differs over the regions of Germany. So we have the north, west, east and south, uh, and the, the low voltage, medium voltage and high voltage grid. And you see that in the south, due to high PV pen uh, penetration, we need more or less uh, like the, the low voltage uh, extensions, whereas at high voltage in the north with the wind power plants, of course, I mean, that's it's somehow reasonable to, to do it this way, uh, we need the high voltage and medium voltage extensions. So that's also regional differences we have over, but everyone should pay something like the, the, the same grid fee all over Germany, so this is an issue we have to take into account. So, you see the big problem, so it's, it's quite costly. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to do in the near time, uh, and we, we really have to make some assumptions to actually deal with this, because otherwise we might run into problems. So, change operational way, change the planning way of how to deal with distribution grids in Germany. Uh, so, this is what we envisioned as intelligent smart grid technologies, um, but it's well, it's, it's more or like less for the grid extension cost, we have like this five years. So uh, we, we might cope with some conventional planning stuff, so more number crunching, more better uh, grids, uh, grid documented quality data in order to, to do simulations. Uh, one way would be DR management, then we have reactive power management, we have uh, load management in place, and we have uh, ICT-based technologies, control technologies for the distribution grid. What I'm going to focus more on is like the uh, DR management and the ICT part in this particular grid, because I have to admit that for planning time uh, of, of German grid extension, a reactive power management and load management is uh, not of a big benefit. So, but that's for planning time of distribution grids. So, uh, one, one, one big issue. Uh, is actually if you cut the DR peak feed in, that's, that's some kind of envision we had by the local uh, uh, German utility in Oldenburg, the EWE. They said uh, we, we have this 5% uh, approach we do, we, we cut the, the, the utmost 5% of the DR load and we found out that we save a lot of grid extension on that one. And we calculated that for the individual scenarios. So you see we took all those scenarios into account for both wind power plants and PV power plants. And uh, the interesting stuff is that if you cut, and we just said, okay, that's 3% for us, if you cut like 3% of the DER peaks, which is actually not a lot, because how, how many times do those peaks occur? Uh, and you plan your grid for those peaks. If you may cut them, you may change your total planning, and that reduces up to 50% of the overall grid extension. And remember those, thousands of kilometers on individual voltage levels we have. So that's just one tiny step which saves a lot of grid extension. Not necessarily money, because you have to deal with the energy management and the control of the DER to cut that, to cut their generation. Uh, but anyway, that's what I'm going to de deep into in the further slides. Um, so DER management in general in Germany cuts 50% of the grid extension and up to 15% of all costs. So that's an overall cost saving uh, till 2032 we have on this uh, very figure of the maximum feed in. Uh, we have to reimburse people for uh, energy not being fed in, so that's the energy substitution we have here. And of course we have to take into account the ICT costs for the individual communication lines, uh, fallback solutions for uh, uh, 61850 based boxes to control DER and so on. But even if you calculate this into uh, you see that there's somehow like here you, you get an optimum. Right here somewhere it must be between 80 and 70 percent. Uh, so uh, we, we were always a bit conservative and said okay we might save up to 15 percent. All the figures we have in this study are always the, the highest cost involved. So it's, it's, the, it's the worst case in terms of benefits you have. It will definitely be better if some things change in terms of, for example, ICT. Uh, the next step we took into, it's, uh, in German, it's Riegelbare Ortsnetztrafo, so it roughly translates into intelligent voltage transformers. Um, so in the low voltage grid, we had always the voltage band regulations on our simulations, and of course, intelligent voltage transformers can help there. 
Of course, it rises the additional cost for the ICT and uh, uh, the tap changer part of the uh, conventional transformer up to 10%. Um, but uh, since we can also optimize the distribution of the uh, intelligent voltage transformers in the German grid, we roughly need about 46,000 of all those aforementioned in the fourth slide I had the overall figures uh, for the voltage transformers. Until uh, 2020, we need like 30,000 new pieces. Uh, of course, those voltage transformers might travel because uh, somehow a voltage transformer only helps up to a certain point and then you have to do conventional grid extensions. Uh, so they are not always on the same place, but we have those uh, figures in place. Uh, and it works pretty much in, in every scenario. And of course, we have less investments in terms of cable being digged into the ground or put onto landlines. Uh, we have less investments on, on voltage transformers because we also save conventional transformers, but we have to pay for the uh, intelligent voltage transformers and for the ICT part. So. Combining measures, actually, if, if there's one great thing and another great thing, it doesn't usually combine. So I like chocolate uh, and I like fish, but it doesn't really combine as a meal. Uh, so we also had to look whether that works if we combine the intelligent voltage transformer uh, and the energy management for the DER generation. But it does, actually. So it's, it's not the same that, that they just add up. Uh, but if we have conventional extension, we have up to 1.3 million euro uh, per year as additional cost. Uh, then we have like with generation management, as I mentioned earlier, we have like a 15% cut. And if we combine it with all the individual costs for intelligent voltage transformer, we have an additional 5% and might save 20% annual costs uh, on the grid extension needed. So uh, basically, summary, conventional grid extension is really costly. So we have a lot of money to be put and buried into the ground till 2032. Uh, the scenarios may actually differ, but we have between 130,000 and 280,000 kilometers of more lines in general. Um, the grid fees for the customer uh, might rise up to 20%. That's not acceptable uh, by the government in terms of uh, being uh, politely uh, to the people actually voting for them. Uh, so uh, it's also not equally distributed. You have the problem in the eastern part of Germany and a lot of problems in the southern part of Germany. Uh, um, so we, the, the spread between the grid fees is, is rising and we, we, we try to, to put the scissors back together. Uh, also, 70% of all extensions are in the first 10 years till 2032. So that's uh, in short terms we have to build in for, for maximum DER penetration of the German distribution grid. And um, the conventional extension also has like, it's always a scenario for all DSOs in general, but some are involved, well, that's fine, but those are really heavily involved. You can pretty much put them out of business when you say, oh, we do it this way uh, under those regulation regime. Uh, so one third of all low voltage and two thirds of the medium voltage uh, grid operators are involved and up to 70% of all medium voltage are penetrated by actually, or impacted more or less uh, by the DR uh, extensions uh, and by the grid extensions following in the next 20 years. We have a different regional density, so 60% of all uh, LV extensions are in the south of Germany due to the PV uh, feed in, and uh, the uh, HV extensions are mainly in the north and in the eastern part of Germany. Uh, and of course, regional technologies drive this in terms of the DXR extension. So it's easier to, to actually cope with the SCADA system and the generation management of a large offshore wind power plant than with 25,000 individual PV panels in, in Bavaria in Germany. So what we actually did and what we took into account in terms of changing the way of how to plan for the distribution grid yeah, yeah, I didn't see that coming, so you could have assassinated me anyway. Uh, <laughs> ah, that's a little, that's a little frightening. So, uh, actually, we, we have like a reduction of the grid extension by like 60% in terms of the overall extension, which doesn't mean cost, but at least less stuff to bury. Um, we have a cut, a, a cut optimum for Germany, not necessarily for the individual DSO, I have to admit, of 3%, which leads to, to uh, a reduction of the grid extensions by like 40%. Um, the intelligent voltage transformer can provide an additional 20%, and then we run up to 60% in not uh, building new um, 
uh, lines or cables in the distribution grid. Uh, that only means a, c a cost cut by like 20%, but anyway, it's money, uh, because the ICT part leads to, to higher operational expansion costs and uh, capital expansion costs of around uh, those 10,000 intelligence voltage transformer we definitely need. So the 46 I had in the earlier slides were like if we only do voltage transformers, but no uh, DRR generation management. Um, the, of course, one problem is that under the regulation regime in Germany, uh, they always differentiate between CAPEX and OPEX. And the problem is that uh, the OPEX costs, so the operational costs annually, arise from around 16% to up to 40%. And that should be somehow uh, brought into account uh, by the regulator uh, because that is something the utilities are really keen on having it clear that they, they just don't put something and then they says, okay, next year okay, we'll get the money back, but that they got annual reimbursement uh, for the individual parts. Um, so we have like the 3% cut of the DR generation uh, feed in. Um, it's quite easy uh, in terms of the concept, I have to admit. I mean, there are still some technical challenges. Um, because you always cut the peaks and reimburse people for the non-fed in peaks. So there's even all the replacement energy into account, uh, taken into account. So people don't lose money, but you do not have to uh, plan your grid for the peak. Uh, of course, with the energy management system, so uh, just to, to bring up who did uh, direct control of DR systems uh, over wide area networks in this room? Uh, just raise your hands. If so, nobody raises his hands, I'm, I have some time, so I can talk about that. Um, it's pretty difficult because uh, you have to talk to a device which is probably in an area where you have no mobile grid, where you have a bad digital dis subscriber line, DSL around, where you have uh, no barely GPRS, not even LTE or whatever. So uh, you can never be sure whether if you want to shut down the DR, it actually works. So you have to work with heuristics there anyway or make sure that you have a pretty decent ICT in place, and pretty decent ICT of, is, of course, with the integration into your SCADA system, always a bit more tricky. Uh, in Germany, we have an additional problem, which I didn't mention at all in this. Uh, we have the so-called smart, smart meter gateway. Uh, it's called the intelligent uh, measurement system, the intelligent, intelligent measurement system, the IMSIS in Germany, and they uh, want to channel every communication to controllable local systems, even DER, through this meter gateway, which is, of course, more costly in terms of ICT, uh, because you have also the, uh, the complexity of integration in an individual household, uh, whereas you could also go like bypass the, the metering gateway and control directly the DR through a SCADA system. So this is still subject to discussions in Germany, which technical architecture will be the way to go. Luckily for us, it's the same price. So the, the distribution of the individual parts and the cost is different, but uh, it adds up to pretty much the same overall sum. Um, the regional costs and a gap in Germany closed using our intelli intelligent technologies. So the grid fee, the high rise of the grid fee was lowered for the north and uh, east uh, German customers and uh, a bit raised. We don't say raised. Uh, for the uh, southern Germans because you, no one wants to pay more grid fee to lower the gap between. But anyway, this is how, how it works uh, if you have like one country. Uh, so that was basically the story. So I'm open to questions. And uh, uh, normally I could talk for hours on this issue because it, it was really fun to do this study uh, in, in the team because we, had, we are from so different disciplines and first up front we had to agree that we wanted to trust each other. Uh, and, and use the same words, uh, but it's, it's really well worth reading. Uh, for this event, I, was, uh, I, I could uh, somehow trick our Ministry of Economics into financing uh, a translation of the complete management summary of the study. So uh, unfortunately, all the 250 pages are in German, uh, but I will send Henrik a PDF of 25 pages translated into English with the core results of this study for you to read. Thanks. Thank you very much, CS. A very interesting uh, presentation about uh, the German DERs and 
It's never easy to be the first speaker in the morning, but I think you caught the, uh, the audience's attention. So they'll probably see me some answers. Olof, yes, be the first. I see. Olof Sommersson, Lund University in Sweden. So uh, the 3% are very central to this, yeah. I believe. Uh, you're talking 3% energy, I guess. Yeah. But what you want to do is cut power, right? Uh, so no. it's, you, yeah. the decision is, is power to make your network limitations and then you allow this to the extent that it builds to 3% of the energy. Is that yeah, yeah, that's pretty understood. much so. It's always uh, translating the stuff, so I uh, somehow always mix up those. But, terms but that's about how yeah, you yeah, do it. Okay, okay, thank you. So, and, and it really differs. So, uh, our local municipal utility, they need 5% to achieve those goals. So, uh, those 3% are more like the average we, we have for Germany. So, actually, sometimes uh, we. For some grids, we might even think that in Bavaria, people need like more like 8.5 or 9%. but. It still figures, uh, the figures still show that it pays out actually with all this technology stuff. Jan Christensen, Dansk Energi. Very impressive studies, and, and I think we can learn a lot. The situation is a bit different in Denmark that we want to cut peak production, uh, yeah. uh, peak load. But, but my question is. When you make all these assumptions and you get these average big numbers, it gives you a lot of money to work with in a way, but, but when you go to the local feeder, can you make the business case on the hardware and the ICT cost to say, well, now we invest in ICT equipment in, instead of reinforcing uh, uh, 100 meters of, yeah. of low so, voltage so cable? We, uh, our model actually would provide for that. But uh, we have to say we, we just calculated it for the whole of Germany. If an individual DSO says, can, come on, can you calculate it for our grid? Then we can say to him if it's a business case or not, and whether he should use like a different mix for some, uh, something like reactive power management or load management will work then. It doesn't work in the general terms for, for overall Germany, uh, but in the individual case, so it's like your, mail, your mileage may actually vary, like, in the, like uh, always uh, on a sticker on an American car. Um, but uh, uh, normally we, we had very good estimates for the overall cost, so it's quite, quite, quite conservative. So I, I think most of the time it shall really work, uh, but sometimes it's, it's that you also have to say that some grids are in Germany are structured in a manner that it doesn't really pay out to run them on your own as a municipal community. So sometimes it's, it's really like you see between those thousands of grids that there should be some f service providers from the larger utilities who have optimized processes, control technology, uh, and so on to, to do like, uh, well, contracting to run them. So that's also something where we can r uh, calculate a business case based on. And uh, I, I think we need consolidation on the overall stuff. And I think calculating them will definitely provide to show where we need consolidation. <coughs> yes, I just came up with one idea when you presented this enormous amount of money to be spent now. Uh, did anybody ask the question, is it now that we change the whole system from AC to DC? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, sorry, that's just it. Uh, so uh, also what, what, I, what I didn't mention is um, we were conservative on actually taking into account stuff like storage or electric vehicles they are not in this. So uh, storage and electric vehicles may or may not change uh, the way the loads are distributed within the grid. And of course, since Germany is quite, quite, quite really conservative, uh, there's virtually no chance of actually uh, doing this, this approach, sorry to say, because of the existing investments. So people don't want to lose them. Yeah, per perhaps we, we could calculate it, but it was forbidden in the original scope. <laughs> Christen Trahold, uh, DTU. Uh, if you wanted to use the solution by placing uh, battery electric storage in strategic places, what would you say the cost would be compared to this? 
That's a tricky question because uh, we, we then don't have the, uh, we, we desynchronize the generation uh, and the consumption of the electricity using storage, of course. And the problem is that I don't have a good feeling on how actually our simulation models would work then uh, because we might even have bad effects because people could save on electricity and feed them in at market times where they get reimbursed more if they will be cut off. Uh, actually, that might work. Uh, so we, we discussed a lot about that and uh, uh, also about where to put them because from the density of those model clusters, you could see where electric storage would actually be beneficial a lot. So we could easily see. Also, you could see where as a terrorism, you should blow up landlines in our model, but we didn't figure out to write this in the study. Um, so there, there are a lot of, of, of places where you say they are crucial for the, for the German grid. And also, you, you see that they have like some kind of interconnection points and it would be beneficial to have storage there. Uh, but uh, also, also biomass, this was totally out of scope. Um, and I don't know if we, we only have positive effects if we use the storage, but that's mainly because uh, German regulation is some kind of, uh, of tricky uh, when, when you have to cope with, with new stuff in the grid. Uh, because people always find loopholes in the individual laws and they benefit a lot. So that's also with the German renewable energy law. So um, and in, in Germany, if you have like a, a PV field on the ground, you get less than if it's on a roof. So, uh, so peasants really build like empty, empty buildings just to, wow, there's nothing in. Yeah, but now I can put my PV on the roof and get more money. And so there, there are always those loopholes, and same uh, true for storage, and people might find, might find a way to squeeze more out of, of uh, storage than actually saving for the overall grid. So, but, but it's a nice idea. We shall ask the ministry to uh, give us money also to, to run simulations based on that one. <laughs> Kai Heusen, DTU. Um, I've luckily had the chance to read this study. Oh, um, of course. <laughs> and it's a, I have to congratulate, it's a very interesting work. Uh, you picked, actually, you didn't get into the ICT development uh, and the different architectures you've yeah. prepared. Um, and there are actually quite some cost calculations which also take the operation maintenance that's into account. Um, but you did not go very far this into demand management, and you already replied some of the questions. Um, my question is, from the methodology of the study, mm -hmm. um, is there limitations to what technologies can actually be investigated with the approach that you took? Uh, uh, what the was the methodology? Time series based? Was it classic? Not from the ICT perspective. So uh, Marie, you can ask Marie in the study when I'm drinking coffee, she cannot answering a question. Uh, so uh, we, we did uh, SCAM-based modeling. So we sliced down all the stuff to individual components and took into account a previous study for we did for the ministry in terms of technology migration, ma migration paths over the time. So for the ICT part, it's quite easy actually to also say there's uh, like a connection to demand response uh, technologies. Uh, we need this previous technology and then we got benefits in, in the maturity level of, of next technologies. So I can easily say that the ICT part is safe also in terms of the methodology because it's M490 mandate anyway. Um, and uh, for the simulation part, honestly, I have to say, ask Sebastian Royans, <laughs> because uh, w the simulation part was, was mainly done by RWTH Aachen, and uh, they, 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 I, I think they, they can uh, put all this demand response and load management stuff really into, into their simulation, so uh, it shall be proof, uh, but since it was definitely ruled out of scope for the study, uh, it's, it's uh, like, like from my point of view, the methodology should work, but I'm not sure whether I can just uh, spend two days on it and give you the results. So it shall be like more fun because there, there's a lot of relation stuff to be taken into account. Um, and also, we always had the focus on grid uh, extension planning. That's not runtime. That's not operation. Of course, demand response is really useful at operation and also people uh, making people think more about the electricity and energy they use in terms of being sustainable. So that's, that's a huge benefit, which of course doesn't come into account at operational planning time.
Yes. And then we are facing back to Denmark. And I'd like to give the floor to David Taggy, which is from the Danish Energy Agency, giving a presentation regarding DERs and DSOs and relations between them. <coughs> yes, uh, my name is David Taggy. I'm from the Danish Energy Association, and I would like to talk about the uh, some of the work we've done in iPower, in uh, Work Package 3. <coughs> so this is my short agenda for today. First, I will talk about the DSOs and some of the challenges that uh, they are facing. Next, a bit about the DERs and why they are so important for the, for the grid and what challenges they also can bring. And the last part is about the demand response, looking to some of the activities we have, and especially what is, is going around, the, what is happening uh, around Europe, and what can we learn from them. So, many of you have probably seen this drawing before, a drawing similar to this one. Uh, it shows how the smart grid can work and how these different actors uh, will integrate and communicate with uh, each other. But the, the focus that I will have uh, today on my speech is on the distribution part, on the distribution grid. So zooming into them, you see the, the responsibilities of the distribution grid is to design the grid so it can carry the peak load in every given point of time. And you can see up to now that has been a relatively easy task because they can have done the calculation. The, the consumption has increased about maybe 1%, uh, in most areas, 2% in some other areas. So it's been relatively easy for the DSOs to, to plan their grid and to, to look into the future and say, okay, hey, what challenges will we, will we face? But that can be quite more difficult uh, when we look ahead because now there, there will come some of these new, or maybe there will come some of these new uh, consumption units such as electric vehicle, heat pumps and, uh, and other units that can have a really big uh, impact on how you should plan your grid and how you should operate your distribution grid. So. These next uh, couple of slides uh, I have borrowed from Dong Energy, and it's uh, a case for, from a Danish DSO, and they have tried to look into what will happen if we, uh, if we get a lot of heat pumps and electric vehicles and so on. And um, what we have done is that the uh, Dong Energy, Danish Energy Association, and also the Danish TSO, we meet up maybe once every three years, and we try to forecast some of the scenario of uh, DERs in Denmark. And you see back in, in 2010, we were quite optimistic uh, when we tried to forecast how many heat pumps there will be in, uh, in the years to come. Because you can see in, the, in this done case, there's not that many uh, that, that we have expected. And especially if we are looking at the electric vehicles, we also there were quite optimistic. The 2010 scenario from, uh, from Dong Energy's area, we also tried to say, okay, maybe it was optimistic, so we also made a 50% scenario, but still that shows that there was way, still way too optimistic because we are right here. So what can you say from this? Yeah, some of you are maybe thinking, yeah, they are really bad to do in DC this <laughs> forecast, but that is, is not really my point. M my point is that it, it is really difficult to, to look into the future and it's really difficult to see, okay, what is go going, to, going to happen? Um, and uh, yeah, later on, you'll also see, I have a slide on, on PVs in Denmark, where we also were, were way off, but uh, things can happen. So looking further into this dunk case, the green area here is the, uh, 
the base peak load uh, forecasted into 2030, and just a, a steadily increase. And now with these more modest uh, forecasts for the additional load for the ERs, uh, we see, see also an increase in consumption. And that could uh, create some issues for, for uh, the DSO. But as I said, we're not sure what is going to happen. So our best guess is that there will be a, a, a bigger increase. But <coughs> what will happen if instead of an a increase, there was a decrease by, let's say, 2% uh, per year from now on to 2030? The Danish government wishes a, a decrease in energy by 3%. So let's say there just was a decrease by 2% from now on to 2030. Then, actually, we'll use a bit less of the same amount of energy uh, as we're doing today, and there will not be a big issue uh, in many areas uh, in, the, in the down grid. So the thing is, it is very difficult to, to forecast this, and they, they need to navigate in this uh, big map of uh, uncertainty. So they don't going to make the too much investment in the grid too early or too late. <coughs> so let's see what uh, happened in the PV scenario. The blue line here is our forecast of uh, how the development of PV will be in, in Denmark. And the green line, and this is back from 2011, uh, and the green line is what actually happened. So you can see right here in the beginning of 2012, suddenly the uh, numbers of PVs in Denmark just exploded, also in, also in the Dung area. <coughs> and actually here, we went, if you're looking at the, at the whole Denmark, we went to having about one or 2,000 PV systems. And in one year, we went from one to 2,000 to over 70 thousand PV uh, installations. So suddenly that there came this big increase and that was because there were some new tax deductions. So suddenly people got their eyes up and said, okay, this is a good business case and everybody wants PV. Afterwards, they removed the tax deduction. It was too expensive and they lowered the, the subsidies so the, the curve started to flat out. And right now, today, we are around this area. And luckily, we, in Danish energy, we also did a study on what, uh, what it meant that we have this big, big increase in, in PVs. And luckily, in most areas, the grid could handle it. <coughs> but uh, if the uh, increase uh, is going to uh, be much bigger now, that could easily, uh, uh, it could easily create issues. So the big question is from, from this point, what is the long-term scenario here? Is it going to fa phase out or is there going to be a big increase? And this, talking about PV, can actually be quite important because I know a lot of time when we're talking about smart grid, we're talking about heat pumps and electric vehicles. We're talking about trying to use the energy when there is a, a off-peak so we, we wouldn't have a congestion in the grid, we have these consumption congestions. But actually, if 30% of the energy comes from PVs in, a, in the Danish grid, we will not have a consumption peak, but we'll have a production peak instead. So this could very well be, be the next big problem uh, uh, in many areas. <coughs> so this is the reason that DERs are so important. Of course, now we are building more and more uh, renewable energy uh, from windmills, and we have a lot of focus on the production side, so we also need these new consumption units, these flexible units that can, can gather the energy. And, and when we're talking about heat pumps and electric vehicles, they are really D 
these, uh, they are flexible, but they are also uh, sources that use a lot of energy. If you take a normal household that have an oil-fired boiler, and they decide to install a heat pump, their energy use can easily increase by 150%. So they, these are, are really units that are making a big difference for, a, for the grid and are units that we, we need to have focus on. So we need to follow the trend, because uh, I don't know what the next big, next big thing will be, if it's solar panels, heat pumps, or maybe something we, we haven't thought about yet that uh, can create these, uh, these congestions and these issues for the grid. So when they come, we need to, to make a decision. Today, when they are uh, um, traveling the grid, the, the thing most DSOs do does is just to reinforce the grid. That is like the, almost the only tool they have in the, in the box. But in iPower, we are, we are working on to give the DSO uh, a second tool if we, we can make a, a smart grid solution instead. And we have looked quite a bit into this to say, okay, what is, what is the right solution? And the right solution is not just reinforcing or not just to, to make a smart grid solution, but we need to do a, a calculation in each, uh, in each area, in each scenario, to see, okay, where does it make more sense to reinforce the grid, and where does it make more sense to make a smart grid solution? And, uh, and you say, what is a smart grid solution? Uh, I say, right now, the first step in a smart grid solution for DSOs today that they can use is to uh, install more measurements in the grid. They're already starting this, uh, starting the rollout of, of smart meters, but also maybe putting up some meters in the, in the substations and starting to gather this information, learn about the uh, how the grid is, uh, how the energy is flowing in the grid. Because in many areas today, or in the, uh, most of the, the low voltage grid, is kind of like a, a black box for the DSO. They don't know how much energy that is used in, in any given point of time. So they need to, to, uh, to get more knowledge about that. Because if they do that, they don't have to run their grid with very high safety margins as they're doing today because they're getting the knowledge, they know uh, how much energy is used, and when they know that, they can run their grid closer to the actual capacity limits and still feel safe that they will not exceed it. So see that as the, the first step, and afterwards when they have that knowledge, it will also be easier for them to ask an aggregator for help because now they know if we're going to have a problem, or if we don't have, don't have. So, what have we done in the work package three in the iPower project? Uh, work package three consists of a lot of uh, sub work packages, and uh, one of them is the uh, work package three point five that we actually are, are looking at right now. It uh, should be finished before the end of the year, and uh, one of the things we are looking at in this work package is if we can generate a signal that we can send to the aggregator so we can ask them for help in a, a critical, situa cri critical situation. And uh, before we can generate this signal, we need some information. We need some uh, information about the DRs. Is this an area where there is any DRs? Is there any flexibility out there? We also need some information about the grid topology how is the grid designed, uh, and, and where will, uh, are we likely to, to have these uh, issues. We need to install me measurements. We need to use the measurements from the smart meters. We need to install measurements in the, in the substations. And we need to make a state estimation. And the reason for that is that is it's not economical possible to install measurements all over the, the low voltage grid. It will be too expensive. So instead of putting meters up everywhere, we will we'll have to put them in certain strategic places and then estimate 
there are other points where we don't have uh, the exact information. And when we have all this knowledge, it will be, we will be able to generate a signal that we can send to the aggregator, say, okay, now we have a problem, could you help us? Or we expect a problem next week or some hours from now, and uh, will you be able to, to help us with that? So this is, uh, is one, of the, one of the goals. And you can ask him what kind of information should you send to the aggregator? What kind of services are we thinking about? Uh, what kind of services does the DSO need? And in another work package, this is actually finished, it's, it's finished last year, we defined five different uh, so flexibility services that a DSO can ask for, and these five all um, should help uh, congestions in the grid. Sometimes there's also uh, voltage issues, and with all the PVs it can very well be voltage issues. So we have also defined two different services for a voltage issue. So the, all this we got a, in a report and we have defined how can a, a DSO request a, a service from an aggregator and, uh, and we have uh, developed the, these, uh, these differences. So if you look into to one of them, for example, the, the PowerMax. The PowerMax is a service where the aggregate, uh, where the DSOs have an uh, agreement with an aggregator that the aggregator will not uh, exceed a certain capacity limit for his uh, amount of DERs in that p particular area where there's a, uh, is a problem for an agreeable point, point of time. And so on, we have also defined uh, some other services that could be very rel relevant for the DSO. The, the thing I would like to uh, <laughs> the thing I would like to say here is that I know it's a and project, I know it's a demonstration project, but there's a lot of interesting happening uh, things happening around the world right now in the U.S., South Korea, also in our neighbor countries. So I think it's uh, important that we also look around us and say, okay. What are they doing there? I'm, I'm glad that we today also have uh, some international speakers so we can, can learn from, uh, what is happening. And especially when we talk about the main response, there's a lot we can learn from, from other countries. Because as you see here on the next slide, this slide is a, um, a study done by the Smart Energy Demand Coalition they did a study back in uh, 2013 to see is there a commercial demand response, uh, demand response market uh, and how are they working and if there's no, not such a market, how can, can this be? So they did the research in 2013 and they did a follow-up this year uh, and luckily there is some uh, 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 advancement. Um, you see Finland and France uh, have uh, developed a market now for, for the main response. <coughs> and the thing they, they found out here also was that when we look at some of the other countries, looking to the US, US alone in 2013, it was a $2.2 .2 billion market for the main response. So there is money out there to be made on, on the main response, but there's also a lot of barriers, there's lo a lot of issues uh, uh, in different countries. And what they find out in the report is the, the biggest issues uh, in many places is the regulatory framework. Because in, in some countries, if you as an uh, individual household would like to be part of a demand response market, you need to fulfill the same criteria as a 50 megawatt power plant you need uh, real-time measurements. So there's these big, big barriers that, does, that it doesn't make any sense for a person to engage in this market. There's other countries where the, the regulatory framework is, is so different from 
the, from each party. So the TSOs have one set of rules, the balance response party have another set of rules, and the retailer, energy retailer, have the, a third old set of rules. So it's very difficult to, to get the uh, economical benefit out uh, as an aggregator or as an individual. So, so we, that is really the main conclusion of this report is that the, the regulatory framework uh, are setting up these barriers. But still, I think there's also something we can look at uh, at the technical side. As I mentioned before, we need to start to install me more measurement, and we are already doing this. We need to get more knowledge about the grid so we know when does it make sense to ask for demand response, and when does it make sense to do some other solution or do some automation or do some other things. Another European study has been done by the European Commission. They have set down a group called the Giant, uh, Res the Giant Research Center, have made a report uh, also this year in uh, 2013. And uh, I think we can be very proud here in Denmark because uh, the pro report shows that Denmark is the leading country when it comes to uh, smart grid projects in Europe. We're the country that is involved in most R&D projects around Europe. I think that's a, it's, it's really good, and iPower is one of the is one of these uh, one of these projects. The thing is, when it comes to demonstrations projects, we are we are beginning to lag behind, and you see a lot of the other countries are doing a lot more demonstration than what we are doing here. So, I think it's really important now we can see. We have, all these, uh, we have all this knowledge, we're doing the report, we're doing the articles, but now it's time to demonstrate what we know, what we can do. Uh, so I think it's really good that we have this uh, demonstration that we're doing here today. And also hope uh, many of you that is going to be involved in, in smart grid projects for the years to come will decide to go into these projects where there will be more demonstration, because I really think this is the part that we need in Denmark. This is the part where we are maybe starting to lag behind because we, I think we have a lot of the knowledge. So just to, to sum up, the, the DSOs, the, it's not always easy to be them. They don't need to invest in the, the grid, but they also need to, to be prepared for what is to come. The DRs, they are really, really critical because of the energy they consume and because they are able to be flexible. But we need, need to remember, we don't know what the, the trend will be for these, uh, these different DERs are yet, and we don't know if there's something completely new that will be the next big boom that will, uh, that will create these issues. And as, as I told you, we need to, to look around and see what we can learn from other countries, and we need to have the focus on the demonstration. And I say normally when I'm finished with a, doing a presentation, I say thank you, but today I, I really mean it, because I would, I would like to say, say thank you for, for doing, doing these demo, demonstrations, and I hope you will do a lot of them also uh, in the years to come. So, thank you. Thank you, David, for, for summing up the, the big problems that you can see as a DSO uh, organization. Um, of course, you have to face the, the fact that uh, the DERs are coming, but uh, I don't think that the, that the grid is that vulnerable, but never mind. No, not right now. But not right now, <laughs> no. But uh, questions for David? Yes? Mass Orb working with the energy architecture and renewable energies. Um, when we are talking about smart grids, we always talk about power, of course. Yeah. Uh, is that your only problem? I, I'm thinking of capacitive load versus reactive load, and I'm talking about even distribution on the three phases. Is it really only power that you want to regulate with a smart grid, or could it be anything else? 
No, it, it could be more, more things. Uh, and of course, uh, as you said, uh, if we can regulate the load on the faces, it could, uh, it could take us a lot further, so we don't need to, to do the re reinforcement on the grid. So of course, we, we need to, uh, as, as I also said in the presentation, I think it's important that we get more knowledge, that we start to use this data so we know is all the energy consumed, uh, is consumed on the, the first phase, or how is the, how is the grid structured, so we, ha I, so we are able to, to, do something, uh, to do something about it. And I think that is, is the problem right now, that we, we actually don't have enough information about the, the distribution grid, about the, the low voltage grid, so we can make these decisions, and it's very expensive to, to gain the knowledge, but it's getting cheaper now, and with the with the smart meters, they they can actually they can gather a lot of information, and I think the DSOs should start to use those information. Many of them are still only collecting uh, the kilowatt hours for billing pur purposes, uh, but the the smart meters have a lot of functions, and they can also measure the the, the energy consumed on individual phases. So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, potential out there. Giuseppe Costanzo, DTU Electro. Uh, I've read the, the report, the uh, high power report, uh, talking about even other services and quite, quite interesting. In your opinion, which is the most interesting service or the one <laughs> you think it will come to the market first, like I don't know, Power Max or Power Cap or the others you have described yeah. in that report? Thank you. Yeah. Good, good question. Uh, I think it will be. Um, uh, maybe one of these small urgent, uh, urgent services, I don't call, remember if it's called the uh, power cord urgent or something like that, where the DSO say, okay, right now there's a, um, we have a, um, uh, some failure in the, in the grid and we need to restructure the grid and they are a lot more vulnerable in those situations. And luckily it doesn't happen very often, so it's maybe not a, a very big market, but I think the, these are the, some of the situations where the DSO say, okay, right now it could be nice, it's an emergency situation, it could be nice if we can ask an aggregator to take it easy on uh, um, charging the electric, electrical vehicles. Uh, but I don't know if that is the one that has the, the biggest potential, probably not, because it's in a very rare situation. But I think the DSO say, would like a service like that, uh, but probably some of the other ones. Power Max, uh, it makes a uh, really good sense uh, because it could be used broader uh, and in a bigger scale. So I think that have a bigger potential. Uh. Thank you, David. Once again, well, final question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a quick one, I hope. Yeah. Um, we are all the, all the time talking about using more of our wind power electricity instead of exporting it at a low price. Mm. Can you try to put a year on when it would be possible for a flexible consumer to actually sell or offer as a service the, the, the property of being able to time shift uh, electricity, use more or use, use less? What, what year are we talking about? Okay. Uh. <laughs> I'll say not before 2016, <laughs> but that is also very, very close. No, as I, as I show on the, on the map before, uh, there's uh, some other countries that are doing the demand response, and the demand response yeah, is, is, the, is the first step. I think that will probably go some, some years from now. Uh, in 2016, we get this um, new uh, Angro, uh, Angros uh, model uh, in Denmark, when, when it's po where it's possible for the consumers to have hourly based billing. Um, so from there, but I'm, I'm afraid that will, in, in Denmark at least, will go some years. But that, that is also the reason I think it's, it's so important to, to look around us to see what is happening in the UK, what is happening in France, in Finland, how come it's possible up there, but it's not possible here. Uh, I know the grid and the structure is different, but uh, the value is there, so uh, 
I think we need to learn from them and, and copy where it, it makes sense. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Yes, so we'll have a presentation of one of the first uh, wheel projects here in, in IPOWER, the Flexibility Clearinghouse, one of the tools for the DSOs. I like the, uh, what David said something about the dong case. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. My name is uh, Lars Henrik Hensen, and I'm from uh, Dong Energy. Actually, I'm from uh, the wind power division, uh, but even though I've been working with uh, Smart Grid during my six and a half year at uh, Dong Energy. So I've been asked to give you an introduction and presentation of uh, FLEC, and uh, I'm glad to, to do this today. Uh, here's an uh, outline of my presentation. First of all, um, I will walk you through the uh, outset, uh, explain you why we derived that, uh, the conclusion that we had to build a, a marketplace for flexibility. And, and then in the second half, I will explain you what FLEC is about in further detail. At the end of my presentation, you will find a reference list where you can find the literature that we have been producing uh, working on, on this. I, I don't want to go in details with this. You can read it afterwards. Okay, so to the introduction here. Um, it's nice to f know um, where you are heading. And in order to understand where you're heading, it's also nice to know where you're coming from. So therefore, I would like to start with this slide. And as uh, those of you who were here yesterday uh, saw Morten Beck, um, he's, he showed a nice slide here from the 70s uh, showing car-free Sundays. Um, this was the period here um, where we actually were busy trying to uh, make a transition from um, oil to coal in the 80s. Um, we became champions in uh, uh, actually optimizing uh, CHPs. Um, I, if I dig my memory, I think I've seen a, a slide showing that uh, if you take a top 20 of the most efficient uh, plants in the world, you'll find more or less all the Danish plants here. Then during the 90s, um, we became busy trying to integrate wind power. And in the zeros, we were busy doing liberalization unbundling of the energy sector. And now here in the teens, uh, we have focus on this green and flexible energy, smart grid, smart energy. So we have inherited from this process here, we have inherited a system which is looking like this. Um, if we say we have uh, the power generation up here, then you can see that the power is flowing into the transmission system, down to the distribution system, and eventually down to the customers. So we have the transmission system, which is um, voltages above 100 kilowatt. And uh, down here, uh, at the distribution, we have uh, below 100 kilowatt. And we have a lot of uh, DSOs down here. In Denmark, the last time I looked, we had about 64. So this is a lot of uh, smaller companies down here. So the main part here is you could call this our infrastructure. And they, uh, it is taken care of by uh, two kinds of entities the transmission system operator and the DSOs here. So this is, um, this is a monopoly. And if we move on, then we could take a look at the commercial side. Um, we, we have the balance responsibles, wholesalers and retailers on the consumption side. On the generation side, it's more simple. Uh, these uh, actors or players have been merged together. So it's most interesting, also from a demand load uh, point of view, to look on the consumption side. These um, uh, entities here have the, um, some roles in the market setup. Um, the BRPs and wholesalers mostly are, are joined together now. Uh, and uh, you, ha you have to be a BRP if you want to make um, trade on, on the energy exchange markets. Uh, or if you want to make trades with the ancillary service markets with the TSO as uh, operator. So this, this setup here is that the BRP and wholesaler, they are buying energy from the energy exchange uh, uh, on behalf of the retailers, and the retailers are then selling this to the customers. Um, and uh, as the uh, setup is today, if you are a customer down here, you can choose whichever retailer you 
like the most. Um, this is very nice, and this is non-flexible load. So how do we deal with a uh, flexible load? Well, today, uh, actually, it's uh, taken care of uh, in exa exactly the same way as um, non-flexible load. We don't use it. Um, so we can make two observations from this drawing, that uh, the retailers and uh, the VIPs, they have no incentives, actually, to take benefit of the flexibility down here. And you can also see from this drawing that the DSO is absent um, for various reasons. Um, and uh, let's dwell a bit about uh, drivers and challenges for the DSOs here. The DSO uh, have the highest, they have this obligation, the highest possible uh, supply uh, security, and they have to do it at the lowest price. Um, actually, David uh, went into some of the challenges that uh, the DSO have. Um, it's increased power consumption, um, and this could be due to heat pumps, EVs, batteries, and this. And they also have this increased um, share of a, a distributed um, generation, like a PV uh, microwind. We haven't seen that much, but uh, micro CHPs could still come on, on, on the page. So on this slide here, I try to enumerate a number of solutions that we have to, uh, that we can use for, for working with these challenges. And um, we have the conventional solution here, which is grid reinforcement. That is the normal drill of the DSOs. Uh, very soon we will have tariffs, which could be of help to deal with uh, these evening peak hours. But uh, I, to my opinion, it's not a solution. If people want to, t to use energy here, they will simply do it. Uh, and then we have the uh, smart grid solution, which is about, uh, in this content context, um, mobilizing flexibility, and that could either be through uh, regulatory, regulatory demands or grid codes, or it could be market-driven. If we jump to the TSO side, then um, we find some other uh, objectives here. They have to uh, ensure the highest possible power supply security on both uh, gas and power, and uh, they are also the driver of uh, the political targets uh, regarding change towards uh, this fossil-free generation, and they have to do it in a social, economic, efficient way. Um, so, of course, then the TSO more or less has the same challenges uh, as the DSO, uh, but they also have it um, uh, more related on an energy level. And due to these political targets, um, they have the challenges of uh, they need to develop new markets and services. And I would say they are also uh, responsible for driving the smart grid. So uh, for this, we also could put up a number of conventional solutions. Of course, we have the grid reinforcement. Um, uh, the TSOs really like the idea of having uh, interconnectors so they can export the challenges to the neighbors. And um, we have, of course, the uh, smart grid here where we again have um, the regulatory uh, demands and we have the market-driven approach. Um, I want to make a small point here that the uh, grid codes, uh, I'm actually in favor of grid codes, um, but not necessarily on the smart grid side, uh, just to put it on the edge it wouldn't make sense to demand from a coffee machine to be very smart. Uh, that would make coffee machines quite expensive. But uh, uh, with uh, uh, things that has uh, higher flexibility, that could make sense. So um, if we go here and try to look at the iPower angle, um, actually, in I'm from uh, Work Package 4, and um, we have an Work Package 4 had the obligation of uh, developing a, a simulation platform where we could take all the nice things uh, we could dream of, uh, of such a smart grid scenario, put it into the tool, and simulate it. Um, in this work, it very fast became clear that we needed a, a, a good place to trade our flexibility. And um, this, um, these challenges I took to the, our um, work package leader group, and uh, we start, started to discuss it. Um, and we found out that uh, actually, if you read our proposal, um, 
it doesn't really say much about how we should do and what we should end up with. So we set down a fast working task force uh, and we came up with a white paper where we actually defined what do we want to get out of the iPower project. Um, and I just sampled the uh, um, two lines here from our mission statement that it is about developing and utilizing flexible consumption and production solutions which offer new possibilities for optimal handling of uh, distribution grids, so mainly on the DSO level. Um, and they, uh, these are market uh, solutions ensuring an efficient uh, also energy system. So these are nice high-level uh, uh, goals to pursue. Um, so with this uh, uh, backup, we could continue our work with pursuing a, a market framework. And uh, we have looked at uh, bilateral contracts, auctions, stock markets, um, trying to figure out how can we make a connection between aggregators and TSOs. Um, we also set down that um, um, the TSOs and, and the DSOs, they should not be the ones who uh, operate price signals. And um, uh, it does because they are monopoly, but it could be nice uh, if the aggregators had this possibility. So whether they go for direct or indirect control, that is um, a business case uh, for the aggregator to decide on. So in this ways, we have covered, um, hopefully, most of the, the scenarios. Okay, uh, now I have tried to set the scene and why we have been dealing with uh, this market uh, stuff in iPower. So now it's time to tell you about this uh, flex stuff, the flexibility clearing house, which is this nice uh, framework for trading flexibility. Um, so let's jump back to the market side <coughs> and uh, look on how, how can we integrate such a new thing in the market. Well, this is uh, my favorite um, architecture, you could call it, where we have the aggregator down here. Actually, there's a quite big number of ways that you could structure this, but uh, to my opinion, uh, this layout here has the highest uh, degree of freedom to go to various solutions. So we have the aggregator here. The aggregator will, um, will do the aggregation of the, flexible, um, of the flexibility here, and the aggregator can offer this to the flex uh, market. And you see up here we have the DSOs and TSOs who are the ones who request this flexibility. Um, then the aggregator here in this setup could also provide flexibility to the wholesalers or BRPs if they have imbalances, if they can see in their setup that, that they have imbalances, or the aggregator could make a deal with the BRP that some of the this flexibility could actually be offered to the ancillary service markets. So we try to cover the whole uh, range. So both dedicated what I would call flexibility services, but we also want to serve the original world. Um, then I have written here, we have a number of services and we want to, with the flex, be quite flexible. So if um, the uh, DSOs or TSOs um, obtain a new um, a desire or request for flexibility, we should be able to quite easily make a service for this. That's an important part here. That's a possibility which you don't have over here because um, the tendency here is that this will be more and more internationalized or standardized. So these, uh, the old markets here are quite rigid. There's another, another challenge here that we have which is a favor of, uh, of the flag. If you are an aggregator or a DER, it's, it's a challenge to just forecast one day ahead. If, uh, if you want to make uh, delivery services for the secondary uh, reserve here, you must be able to do this one month ahead, and that is, that is close to impossible for, for these kind of resources. So with the flag here, we have targeted a very short uh, forecast schedule, and this is, a, uh, is to be built into the um, services. Before I dig down and, and walk you through the flex solution, um, I just want to put your mind in the right direction. So what we do here uh, traditionally, when we talk about uh, power, we're doing planning by forecasting, we're doing scheduling by dispatching plans, 
we are doing operation, we execute our plans, and we are supervised that they are doing as supposed to. And uh, of course, by the end of the day, we are doing settling. Um, another slide that, that I have to present to you before we, we dig into to flag is that when we talk about these uh, energy markets, uh, we have an operational phase. Before the operational phase, we have a market phase. So this is the Elspot. It's running on a daily basis. If we dig one, dig deeper, then you will see that uh, this uh, L spot has been divided into 24-hour markets. So we have uh, 24 L bus markets. It's important for me to convey this idea that actually we are dealing with uh, markets that are operated on various time scales. Uh, this one. You could actually go one dig deeper, and then you would have what is called the regulating power market, where we have um, a finer resolution again. <clears throat> so try to keep in mind that we are operating on different time scales. Um, and uh, then after the operational uh, time, then we have the balancing power market, where we clean up all the unbalances and, and send the bills to the right ones who, who, uh, did, the, who did not deliver the services. Okay, now we're ready. You can see the coloring here is from uh, the same as uh, with this traditional uh, um, decomposition. So we have the planning, planning, scheduling, and operation and settlement. If I take the TSO or the DSO here, uh, doesn't matter, it's pretty much the same that they're doing. Then uh, I would say in the control room, what they do is to generate load profiles. They try to estimate the grid flow and uh, on this behalf, they derive on some request for flexibility. If you are a DSO today, the only thing you can do here is um, to uh, dig more copper in the ground. But if we assume uh, that the also the DSOs have the capabilities of going out to um, flexibility providers, well, then they could make a request. And uh, here the aggregator uh, hopefully is ready. They have the same setup here that they are forecasting their flexibility. Um, they are doing aggregation and they optimize the flexibility. And if they can see that they ha have surplus um, flexibility, uh, then of course they will make a bit to the um, system side. Now that the system side has achieved uh, some new um, possibilities, they can start to plan it into their um, um, schedules. And uh, of course then the, the, they will do contracts uh, with the aggregators. Um, now we come to this point that you must remember that this is taking place on this different uh, time scale. So this is the, sorry, the idea of uh, having these markets operating on different scales. And what we have uh, designed here is actually one of the products that we have been looking on here uh, is a DSO product that would work on uh, several months scale and uh, other products would come down to maybe our scale. So, so these uh, things are working together and, and uh, in they are interlinked. Now, we have uh, made the contracting. Now we can enter the operational hour and we can have our activations. And of course, the aggregators will provide uh, according to contract. And by the end of the day, we do the payment. So this is very simple what Flick is about. No big deal. We'll have a market phase, and we will have a bookkeeping, um, supervision, and payment. And yeah, you could say that's not a big deal. But the, the setup here is very much targeted on, on uh, flexibility, on the DERs that are out in the landscape. So uh, if we go to the uh, more design side, uh, we could look and see what kind of new fun functionalities do we need for, for doing this. Well, uh, since Flag is a new thing, we need to be build uh, interfaces, uh, market clearing, uh, uh, market and clearing stuff, contracting, contract supervision, and settlement. On the aggregated side, um, I would say they are mature. They hopefully know what they're doing, so they would have flexibility assist assessment tools. They also have assessment tools for their financial setup, so they know what flexibility they can provide at which price for the system. What they need to build is a flex um, uh, interface. If we jump to the DSO side, well, this is new stuff for the DSO, so they would have to 
go in and understand the flexibility that they have in the system. They would need some assessment tools. It's also a matter of understanding a new business case. It's not digging copper into the ground. It's uh, deferred uh, uh, investments. So if they can make a better business case uh, by buying flexibility compared to uh, put copper into the ground, well, then it should be beneficial for them to go this way. On the TSO side, uh, they are already masters in the ancillary services, so they know they have the tools here. They would need a FLEC interface. And, and then, in principle, we are up running. Um, I promised you to look at uh, our prototypes uh, and show you how far we are. Here, um, we have the five products that David talked about. And uh, we have actually developed uh, three of them. Um, and we have also here very lately developed a TSO uh, service, which we call uh, Fast Frequency uh, Reserve. Um, we today had the idea that we wanted to uh, uh, demonstrate this power cap. Um, the plan here was to have a, actually a full business case from our DSO down to a greenhouse and do this as close as if uh, FLEC actually was um, uh, in the market. Um, unfortunately, our DSO had to jump out of, out of uh, this uh, deal uh, due to the coming uh, tariffs. They faced the problem that <laughs> due to this tariff, um, they could risk pushing um, the greenhouse into a more expensive hour and should they then reimburse the extra cost that they had because they should have uh, the flexibility. Um, and if they gave this uh, benefit to this customer, then in, uh, they, they would have to give it to all others. So by th they jumped out, it was too complicated. So one smart grid initiative uh, uh, should shut down another one. Um, so we stopped this one and we went into the power max and this is what you will see this um, afternoon. Um, so we have implemented the power cut plant and we have implemented the power max. There was a question down here about uh, how we did the priority. Uh, actually, the power cut plant uh, we discussed with our own TSO, uh, sorry, DSO, and um, they, they were giving the possibility which of these would you like to have the first, and they chose the power cut. Um, but as I said, today we'll see um, this, the power max. Uh, just stepping back to April, um, this power cut on an IT level, we, we did a demonstration at IBM, and we showed how um, the power cut plant uh, is, is working, and um, by this we demonstrated the, the IT setup. Um, today we'll see real live demos with the uh, power max, and it's going to be interesting when you enter reality. Um, David also push, uh, touched upon this. Um, what PowerMax is about is that uh, the DSO has forecasted a peak loan. What to do about it? We believe that we have flexibility, so the DSO goes into Flick and buys um, the service from aggregators having stuff out in the grid where they have the problem. So, it's time to wrap up. I hope I have uh, convinced you that the FLEC is a parallel marketplace, um, which fits actually quite well into the existing world. We don't have to make a lot of dif differences to make this running. Um, we can ac accommodate uh, flexibility services from these DERs, uh, and, and right now it's based on the re requests from TSOs and DSOs. But actually, it would be quite simple for us um, to also target the BRPs if they would like to, to buy this flexibility or they could be granted the possibility to put offers or request themselves. Um, and as we have seen a couple of times here, the aggregator is an emerging business. It's not so theoretical anymore. They do exist. Uh, we had one yesterday, David Hill, from Open Energy um, presenting Dong Energy has uh, the power hub, and um, I also am sure that uh, Matthias could enumerate a number of German um, uh, aggregators. Hmm? So the downsides here, we'll move so you can see it. The downsides, it's not all glamorous. 
um, we need to find an aggregator who would go in and take the operational um, obligations of, uh, of operating flag. Um, as we heard also from David, currently we don't have any burning platform, um, but um, <coughs> that could very easily um, uh, arise again, uh, depending on the funny ideas from our politicians. Uh, if they treat it uh, the right way, uh, then we get another boom, and uh, then uh, flag could be interesting to have in place. So uh, I would say right now we are doing, like Mask McKinney says, um, Hmm. Who can uh, translate that? <laughs> we want to be in place with the tools before the shit happens. <laughs> um, and there's another, um, uh, David also talked about um, uh, obstacles that right now, uh, how the DSO uh, um, uh, benchmarked um, they are actually only benchmarked by uh, their assets and not by operational matters. So actually it would be a bad idea for them if they wanted to, to go for buying operational flexibility. Uh, it would be a minus on and, and, uh, and their um, benchmarking. Final remarks? Well, in the uh, work package before, we have been working with uh, making prototypes of flag services. Um, we have... Um, uh, specified and designed this, and this has been documented. Uh, we have um, a number of, we have two services uh, implemented already, and um, uh, the first TSO service is, uh, I would say, more or less ready for implementation. I need to write the final words in the report, and then it will also be available. Um, on the demonstration side, um, yeah, we have demonstrated the IT solution uh, in April. Um, today, we are uh, making another attempt to do demonstration, and maybe at our workshop in November, maybe we could have a TSO, you never know, demonstration, but I would work actively uh, pushing this direction. And then, final takeaways. More and more flexibility enters the system, and we need to have focus uh, to have this flexibility made controllable. Otherwise, we just have more and more non-controllable stuff, and this is not what we want. Flexibility can be traded. Um, we need just a dedicated market. Uh, the old markets are not that fit for, for flexibility. Um, and I would say, uh, but I'm a bit colored, Flex is a promising solution. Um, we just need to find this operator. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, very interesting. Um, since we have a flag demonstration this afternoon with Esteban and Anas, I suggest that uh, the more technical questions for flag will be waiting until the afternoon. I suppose you'll be here also. Unless oh. there's a single question for, for, for Lars here, I suggest that coffee is on the, on the table <laughs> and uh, we'll be back here at a quarter past 11. But are there one or two questions? Yes. Dennis from Kamstrup, <coughs> do you have any idea of, uh, of uh, what size of investment would will be uh, possible to uh, to pay back uh, uh, by providing this kind of flexibility? Um, how many kroners could you accept to invest for, for example, one kilowatt of uh, of flexibility? I have no real numbers. Um, this is uh, something that uh, our colleagues from VP5 might have an answer on next year. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, actually, that's uh, one of the things that uh, they, they would like to answer as well. Um, the thing I showed you with the DSO, at least, the thing that would drive this business case is the, that they can uh, avoid uh, all the costs from digging down copper in the ground. And I do believe, at least in the business case that we had established for the service that we did not do, um, but uh, the my colleagues at the DSO in Dong actually thought uh, there could be a business case. Okay, thank you. See you here in quarter past 11.
Uh, hello. Uh, after of, uh, all of these theoretical talks, uh, finally we want to demonstrate something. Uh, my name is Aggregator today. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, I am Samira Rahnama. I'm a PhD student at uh, Alborg University. And uh, I will uh, present the Work Package 2 demonstration setup. And uh, we are going to uh, demonstrate our experimental setup today uh, together uh, with my colleagues. Uh, this is a joint work uh, between Alborg University, uh, Danfoss, uh, and Gonfoss, and then um, Torben Green from Danfoss and Casper Hilo uh, Aline from Gonfoss also present their own setup. So it's uh, work package two. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me tell a bit about the uh, work package two and uh, what we are working on work package two. Uh, actually, uh, Lars Henry covered uh, some of the things I, uh, I wanted to say, and also David. <laughs> but I just want to say that in work package two, we uh, are working on the uh, consumer side, and uh, we all uh, agreed that uh, in the future, a smart grid uh, consumer will uh, play an active role uh, in uh, providing ancillary services to the grid, and this uh, requires new entities, uh, and one of them is aggregator, and uh, a general definition I can uh, give uh, from the aggregator is the entity which is uh, placed between uh, uh, a number of consumer and a grid operator uh, to handle the services that can be offered by these consumers to the grid. But what the aggregator's uh, responsibility is and uh, which entities it has interaction with, however, it depends on many factors. Uh, the aggregator may want to provide services to the DSO at the distribution grid level, to the TSO, or uh, to the BRPs. Uh, different kind of uh, consumers can be aggregated, uh, ranging from uh, household appliances uh, to uh, large industrial uh, consumer. Uh, and the different control policy can be taken by the aggregator to manage the DRs, direct control, indirect control. But uh, in work package two, uh, we, uh, uh, we focus on designing an aggregator based on direct control policy and the aggregator will play in uh, hierarchical setup, as you see here, it's similar to what uh, Lars Henrik showed uh, to you. Um, uh, we uh, assume uh, industrial consumers in our setup, so uh, a few of them is big enough in order to bid in the market, and we can imagine uh, uh, some uh, central controller at the aggregator that uh, uh, works based on direct control and informa information exchange between the DRs. Uh, uh, and uh, we considered uh, this scenario specifically in uh, work package two that uh, the aggregator is uh, uh, received some uh, power reference from the top level controller, could be DSO, TSO, or a BRP, and uh, the uh, task uh, and the, um, the aggregator should follow this power reference within a certain period of time, which we called it the activation time. Then the task of the aggregator in, in this setup is to distribute this power reference between uh, the number of consumer in an optimal way uh, with considering the uh, constraint uh, on each consumer. And uh, to do that, uh, aggregator needs to know some uh, parameters uh, from the consumer that uh, kind of characterize the flexibility uh, of the consumers. Um, other than this power distribution, uh, we have another distribution from the top level controller to uh, the aggregator. For this level, we assume some static optimization, and it's like that before the activation time, each aggregator will communicate the cost or profit curves, which says the cost of uh, offering uh, flexibility per uh, specified power reference, and uh, based on this information, the top level controller uh, will run uh, a one-time optimization uh, to find this, uh, the optimum uh, value for this alpha. And um, this alpha will be fixed during the uh, activation time. 
But today, uh, for our uh, demonstration setup, we just consider one part. Uh, we have one uh, aggregator and uh, we have two DERs, which are supermarket refrigeration system and the chiller system connected to the ice tank. And uh, we aim, uh, hopefully, to uh, demonstrate one of the DSO services. Why DSO services? Uh, David already mentioned that uh, in work package three of iPower, uh, people already worked on the definition of uh, power se uh, the services that can be offered uh, from DERs and uh, would be interesting uh, for the DSO part. And uh, as you saw, basically there are uh, seven type services and uh, among them, uh, we want to demonstrate power max scenario. So, um, Giuseppe, I guess, ask which one uh, is the most interesting. Uh, I would say PowerMax because we want to demonstrate it today. And why PowerMax? Because the first uh, three services is in the first three services. It's just uh, it's like that the aggregator just sends some static set point uh, to the DERs, and there is no closed loop control. Uh, between the DERs and the aggregator, so uh, without it's less interesting uh, to demonstrate. And uh, the last two services contains both active power and reactive power, but the focus is on reactive power and the DERs uh, that are available uh, for our demo uh, just uh, contains uh, active power. So uh, then the most uh, interesting services uh, uh, for uh, that can match to our setup is power cap and power max and uh, these are uh, kind of the same similar to each other and the only difference is in the involvement of uh, DSO in the power cap services DSO is also in the loop and uh, provides some dynamic feedback to the grid uh, but in power max uh, DSO just uh, sends some static set point to the aggregator and the closed loop control uh, will be between the aggregator and the DERs since PowerMax is simpler, uh, we decided to try this first, and uh, hopefully in the future we want to also try power uh, cap scenario. You already saw uh, this figure also. Uh, I just want to say the basic idea behind the PowerMax scenario is to, uh, by buying this service, DSO can be ensured that the aggregated consumption will be below a, a specified power. So during this time, the aggregator uh, will be activated to uh, ask the consumer to lower their consumption uh, behavior. So uh, different parts of this, uh, the <laughs> different components uh, of our demo uh, are located in different places. Uh, we were running aggregator at the campus of Aalborg University and uh, actually it worked well. <laughs> I hope it will work uh, well today from here. Uh, we have chiller with ice storage that is uh, located in a, at the campus of Gonfos in Biambu. It's a nice city and I spent three weeks there. Nice small city. Uh, we have a supermarket refrigeration system at Norbrook and uh, we have uh, syslab facilities here. So we uh, connect these parts uh, virtually through the internet. So here are the basic uh, components of our setup and uh, I will say in short uh, about the uh, sequence of operation in our demo and then uh, I will run and uh, I will say in details. So as I said, uh, the, uh, the DSO uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, analyze the grid and based on the load forecast that is available for DSO uh, before the activation time, the DSO is able to say to what extent uh, the, uh, we need to lower the consumption. So it can define this power max scenario and the DSO will report this power max to the aggregator before the activation time. When the activation time comes, uh, the aggregator run an optimization problem uh, which yields to the desired power reference for a supermarket system and for a chiller system. So aggregator asks the consumer to follow this power reference and the consumer uh, will try to follow this in the best possible uh, way. They change their local setting in order to follow this. 
and then they will uh, report the actual uh, measured power uh, to the aggregator and uh, the aggregator uh, will announce the aggregated consumption to the DSO. Uh, we don't have super, uh, we uh, don't connect supermarket and chiller to the syslab actually, so we simulate the supermarket and chiller with some dump loss at the syslab and uh, we also need some scale parameters to scale down the system, uh, but this last part, uh, maybe it's more relevant when we want to uh, demonstrate power cap scenario because uh, in this scenario we have uh, DSO also in the loop and uh, we get uh, feedback from the syslab. But since we want to have all the uh, setup, uh, we try it also today. So uh, here is the agenda of our talk uh, from now on. I will start uh, a one hour uh, activation time uh, we need at least one hour uh, to see something tangible. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in the meantime, I will explain the power max scenario and uh, what we expect from the aggregator, and uh, what in, uh, what kind of information we need to exchange between the components. Then uh, we will have a break, or you can also ask question during this time, just to let Casper and Torben comes and uh, explain their own system. And uh, at the end, uh, I will uh, explain uh, the optimization <laughs> problem at, at the aggregator and then end of the activation and we can see and discuss the results. Uh, but what will you see on the screen uh, when I start the program? Uh, basically, you will see uh, these uh, five graphs. Uh, the desired power uh, reference uh, that is asked by the aggregator and the uh, measured, actual measured power reference for both supermarket and chiller system. Uh, we also see the aggregated uh, consumption to, s to compare it with the power max limit, uh, both on this screen and uh, we can also see the dump loads and it should be the same here. And we can see the thermal energy that is stored in each system, which, is, which we can interpret it as a state of the charge of the system. Uh, and these are the parameters that kind of characterize the flexibility, the available flexibility in each system. So now, activation time. <laughs> Uh, so I set the activation time one minute later, so I need to wait one minute just to run the program. <laughs> So it takes some time to uh, see the uh, graphs on the screen. So uh, before uh, this appears, uh, let me just vote what we expect uh, to see from the aggregator. Depends on the power max, the amount of power max, and depends on the duration of the activation time, we can see different behavior and different power distribution. But uh, this is the one that uh, is the most interesting one. Uh, and. Uh, we would like to hopefully see this behavior on the screen. Uh, so, as I said, in power max, we want to keep the consumption below this level, that is uh, defined long time before the actuation time. And um, 
if the aggregated consumption is already below this level, then no action is needed from the aggregator, but we assume that it is not. So this means that each DER should uh, lower the consumption uh, in order to keep the aggregated consumption below this level. But uh, DERs may simply say no to this request because uh, this uh, maybe makes uh, them to work outside of their uh, optimal uh, area. And uh, for example, in supermarket system, maybe this makes uh, the uh, cold room of the, temp uh, the temperature cold room go uh, above the limit. Uh, so please don't uh, make it big, then we cannot. And uh, at the chiller side, uh, maybe we have, uh, this may, may lead to some uh, discomfort uh, in the room that we need to keep it cold. Uh, but uh, here we aim to use uh, the flexibility of two different DRs. Both of them are uh, thermal energy storage, but with different uh, characteristic. Uh, one of them is chiller system, and chiller is equipped with the uh, ice tank. So the aggregator can ask the, the chiller uh, to save some ice in the tank. Uh, and uh, then we can use the ice tank uh, uh, when the activation time comes and we can melt the ice uh, and uh, we can then lower the consumption of the chiller. And uh, keeping ice inside the ice tank uh, is, al is almost with no cost because there is no, uh, the ice tank is isolated very well and there is no uh, loss to the surrounding uh, but uh, making ice is with cost because the chiller needs to be run with a uh, lower COP in order uh, to make ice. Uh, but at, uh, on the other side, we have, uh, so we can say that chiller is a low COP unit with uh, less cost, less loss. Uh, so when the activation time comes, we can. Uh, ask the uh, chiller to decrease its consumption uh, to this level, but we can't keep the chiller off for a long time. This uh, due to several reasons. For example, sometimes uh, we need to run the chiller and we need to use the ice tank uh, together to uh, satisfy the cooling load. But uh, we have another DERs, which is supermarket system. And uh, in supermarket, we can store thermal energy inside the refrigerated food for later uh, use uh, in the future, but uh, uh, keeping uh, energy inside the supermarket is with uh, loss uh, uh, because there is a heat, uh, uh, because the food, uh, there is loss uh, to the surrounding. Uh, but on the other hand, saving process, uh, we, we don't have significant drop in the, COP, uh, in the COP of the system during the saving process. So uh, we had the idea uh, that uh, we can use the uh, activation time to uh, save some energy inside the supermarket while the chiller is off. Uh, so basically in this part, chiller, uh, supermarket use uh, uh, more, ener uh, more energy that uh, it needs. Uh, so uh, it will be run uh, above the baseline, which is the uh, preferred uh, power consumption. And then when a uh, chiller needs to uh, switch, uh, to be switched on, uh, the supermarket can reveal this uh, energy that is already stored during the activation time. Um, and this uh, switching uh, behavior uh, uh, can be repeated several times uh, during the activation time. Uh, Today we assume one hour activation time, but uh, basically uh, if you look at the report uh, from PowerMax scenario, uh, it is defined for four hours, I guess. So with this switching behavior, we are able to offer this for two hours. Okay, uh, you can see uh, this, the system are running on, this, on the screen. Uh, uh, 
uh, actually, I would like uh, that this uh, this is the actual uh, measurement, uh, and uh, it uh, was above the limit all the time. And I would like to see this above the limit, but not we are not lucky today. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, desired and measured power of the chiller system and the supermarket system. Uh, this figure, uh, uh, this actually shows the state of the charge of the chiller system and can uh, say actually uh, uh, how much ice we have uh, in the ice tank. Uh, so uh, the chiller is able to provide this amount of energy for upregulating and this amount of energy for downregulating. Uh, for the supermarket system is a bit different. Actually, this is the uh, total uh, heat, uh, total capacity we can get from the supermarket system, but since supermarket is a bit different than chiller system, and uh, we have some other constraint, uh, Torben will explain this better. We cannot uh, utilize all the capacity uh, at each sampling time. So the supermarket can just uh, provide this amount for upregulating. Uh, for downregulating and this amount for upregulating. And we have, uh, in this scenario, a, a supermarket uh, uh, will uh, do both upregulating and downregulating, but chiller is just doing downregulating, so we just melt ice uh, in the tank. So we start from here, at, at the end, you can see how much ice we melt to provide the cooling load at GOMFOS. So let me uh, talk more about uh, our setup. In order to uh, develop uh, an ag aggregator setup in direct control, we need to establish these three items. Uh, one is the information exchange between the components. Uh, one is the model of the consumption units. And uh, the last one is the optimization problem at the aggregator. We need to specify these three items. So let me go through the details of, this, of each of these. Uh, first, the information exchange. But uh, you can see also on the screen that the chiller is uh, switched off uh, according to aggregator comments and the supermarket try to follow the reference. So as I said, uh, what uh, information we need to uh, exchange, uh, what uh, the DSO will send to the aggregator. Uh, in our setup, we consider uh, that the DSO will send a 24-hour power reference to the aggregator before the activation time. So um, when we have uh, um, activation, for example, uh, DSO uh, will uh, set it to the power max, and when there is no activation, uh, DSO will set it to the maximum uh, power of the whole portfolio. So for example, here we assume one activation time, but it uh, depends on the contract. Uh, we can assume more than one activation time and also uh, we can negotiate about the duration of the activation. Then uh, the aggregator received this power reference and uh, uh, the aggregator will extract the duration of activation and the uh, time of the activation and uh, the aggregator will uh, report this to the supermarket and chiller before the activation time. But uh, uh, what kind of information we need to exchange uh, during the activation time? from the aggregator to the supermarket at each sampling time. Uh, the aggregator uh, will uh, send the uh, uh, vector, which contains the uh, desired deviation uh, from the baseline uh, from the current time to the end of the activation. So uh, this means, for example, that the aggregator asks the consume, ask the supermarket to increase uh, the consumption by this amount and then decrease it by this amount from its preferred consumption. Uh, other than this, uh, the aggregator uh, also needs to communicate the uh, time of the first upregulating time <laughs> and uh, the uh, duration of the uh, first upregulating time. Uh, supermarket uh, 
needs to know this in order to uh, calculate uh, its uh, flexibility. Uh, Torben will explain this uh, in his slide. But if we uh, don't communicate this, then supermarket might simply say there is no flexibility in my uh, DERs. Uh, how about the chiller? At, uh, the chiller we use in this uh, uh, demonstration can just accept uh, three levels of power. And uh, mm, these are basically zero, one, and two. So uh, zero means that please charge the ice tank uh, uh, with the maximum power. One means discharge it uh, without power consumption. And two means just consume your baseline. Uh, so what uh, the consumer needs need to report to the aggregator. Um, from the chiller to the aggregator, uh, the chiller should uh, communicate the uh, actual measure power uh, to the aggregator. Uh, and uh, other than this, it uh, needs to communicate the minimum power, the maximum power, and the baseline power. Um, and uh, these uh, values, uh, might change uh, during the activation, but for example, for, for our chiller in this demo, uh, these are fixed uh, during the activation time. Uh, and uh, what else? Uh, uh, we, the aggregator cannot uh, switch on and off the uh, chiller as fast as uh, she want. Uh, and there is uh, some uh, limit uh, on it, on the minimum run time and stop time. <coughs> stop time. So uh, when uh, we ask the chiller uh, to uh, be switched off, uh, we cannot ask uh, him to switch on uh, before uh, any of these uh, samples. So this also should uh, uh, communicate to the aggregator, uh, but just once <coughs> before the activation time as a constraint that uh, should be taken in, in, into account in our uh, uh, controller. And uh, in connection to this constraint, the aggregator also needs to know the status of the chiller before the activation time in, o in case if there is uh, uh, switching during this time. Sometimes I cannot focus because I'm also <laughs> looking at the <laughs> graphs and I'm nervous to see what happens. <laughs> But I saved uh, some uh, results. Uh, the last time I uh, run my program from all work, it works well. And I can show you, and I can promise there is no cheating. <laughs> OK. Uh, aggregator also needs to know some parameters that describe the flexibility of Chiller system and uh, also the simple model of chiller system. And these uh, parameters basically are the uh, state of the chart in the beginning of the activation and also the COP of the system. So the, the chiller needs to uh, report the COP in charging mode and in direct cooling mode. Uh, uh, you, you can see uh, in charging mode the, the building is not uh, in the loop and chiller is just used to charge the ice tank and in direct cooling mode the, the uh, ice tank is not utilized and the chiller is uh, cooling the building alone. And uh, other than this, uh, the aggregator needs to know the thermal energy in the beginning of the activation time, uh, how much energy uh, it can provide for upregulating and for downregulating. How about the supermarket? Same as chiller, the supermarket needs uh, to communicate the measured power at uh, each uh, sampling time, and also the minimum power, the baseline power, and the maximum power for the supermarket. These are not fixed during the activation. And uh, we model the uh, so several cold rooms and display cases that the supermarket are lumped together to 
one storage and we model uh, the thermal uh, capacity of the food in one storage. So uh, same as the chiller, uh, the aggregator needs to know uh, the available flexibility for up and down regulating uh, in the beginning. And also we need, uh, we model the thermal energy changes uh, with respect to power change with a first order model and this first uh, order model parameters K and Ta should also be uh, communicated uh, to the uh, aggregator. In our setup, these are fixed during the activation, uh, but um, uh, yeah, we deviate once, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we can also update these parameters uh, if we have some uh, online estimation at the supermarket. Okay, uh, according uh, to the agenda, uh, Torben should, talk, should come and talk about his own system, but uh, before that we assume break, but you can also ask questions during this time because we need one hour to uh, show something on the screen and maybe it's a bit boring to <laughs> look at just the screen and see, yeah, it's not uh, interesting, demonstrating something with, uh, about thermal storage is not that much interesting, I know, so, but, uh, Maybe I can say a bit about this. Uh, actually, uh, when we run uh, our, al our algorithms before, many times, we see that uh, we cannot uh, be below the power max all the time. But uh, we have to deviate it, but for, for short uh, period, because uh, units, uh, the, the response, uh, uh, of the units uh, to the step change is always with delay and with some overshoot. And during this time, uh, we uh, deviate the, uh, uh, the, the limit, but I don't think it's a problem from, maybe they, David can say it better. I don't think it's a problem from DSO point of view if we deviate this limit. And I, I, I guess we discussed it once uh, through the Skype, uh, if, if we debate it for uh, just few sample time. But at least with this, and now we come back, <laughs> uh, but with this uh, solution, we can uh, uh, offer these services for a long period uh, with uh, uh, aggregating uh, the flexibility of two different DRs. And uh, the DRs uh, doesn't uh, need to run uh, for a long time outside of uh, their optimal behavior. So, yeah. We have also, uh, the Chile is also getting off. Actually, Casper would like to see this behavior because said, I can explain it. <laughs> so, I'm happy if you, uh, to answer your question if there is any question. Or you are free to go and enjoy the coffee. <laughs> I, I will just have one comment. I yes. mean, we all appreciate a slow simulation but this is not a simulation. This is actually real because yeah. you can see over there on the monitors there that actually something is happening in Syslab even though that you cannot hear. But yeah. you can see that the same values that are displayed there are displayed over there. So she is not cheating. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I have a friend uh, at Gonfos. I can call her and ask if he can feel it. <laughs> this. <laughs> I can maybe I, I can maybe comment on you can say you go over the limit there, but uh, as Amir said, it isn't really a, a, a big issue for for the DSOs, because the the grid can handle that uh, a bit of overload in, in a short period of, of time. So if it's a, an overload of yeah, even 50 percent or, or even 100 percent maybe in five minutes, it it isn't a big a big issue for for the DSO. Uh, it can, the, 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 the grid can handle uh, a grid by uh, uh, a bit of an overload in a short period of time. So yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. for saying this. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's good to say that the, in this demo, we just used two units, and it's really 
difficult uh, to provide something with these two units and we have some limitations. Uh, for example, the chiller system can just accept some discrete level, so we don't have that much flexibility, but, at, uh, but uh, with this situation, we can offer these services. But if, I mean, if we have uh, several units, then uh, uh, we definitely can offer uh, uh, this service in a better way, uh, but the, the main point is here is that we need to aggregate uh, the flexibility of different DERs to achieve this goal and to convince the DERs to take in part in this. Yeah. Yes, more a uh, technical question. On the graph number one, we see the chiller. Yeah. The desired set point, the red line, is the set point coming from the aggregator to the unit. Yeah. So we observe that the aggregated power overshoot over the power max, yeah. and then the chiller reacts. But why uh, the desired it, Actually, it's set not. Point? Uh, the reaction of the chiller is not about the, the deviation, because the, okay. uh, the chiller uh, uh, didn't see this deviation. The chiller just see the reference, and. Uh, just react to this reference. So the closed loop is just that the aggregator see the uh, uh, updated value of maximum and minimum power and the available flexibility and send some new references. But uh, for example, in my program, sometimes it's, uh, the, the uh, optimization problem uh, was infeasible because, for example, uh, we switched on the uh, chiller and uh, we are not allowed to switch it off uh, before, any, before 10 samples, for example, in this setup, and we can see that the supermarket cannot follow and there, there are some deviation, but the aggregator uh, couldn't do anything in this region and should, uh, so for this, uh, uh, we assume some other controller uh, than the optimal controller uh, that uh, just communicate the uh, uh, previous value to each unit as a power reference, but. Um, so in this case, there was a second control loop that uh, reduce the chiller power uh, to yeah, uh, Yes, but uh, I think maybe Casper can explain why the chiller is getting off oh, during this okay. one, but it's not uh, in response to the deviation. Okay, it's not in response to the deviation. chiller didn't say this. Of course, yeah. yes, thank you, thanks. But uh, maybe I can say that uh, in theory, we assume, other than this, the optimization problem, we assume uh, some uh, PI controller, feedback controller, uh, on above of the optimization problem to see the measurement and to change the power reference uh, according to the real measurement. But uh, it is not demonstrated today. It just, it's just in theory, hopefully in the future. Okay, maybe, maybe I could respond, to the, respond a little bit to the uh, chiller. Uh, first of all, I'm Casper Lune from Grundfos. I will show you a few slides about the chiller system afterwards. But what you see up here is actually the fact that the chiller is very non-ideal, so it's it's hard to predict exactly what, is, what it's going to do uh, because the, uh, it, was it is a retrofitted system, so it's not designed to, to do power reference following. So that's really what we see here. And, and on another day, it would be, be above, and that's the, the kind of stuff that you have to deal with in, in the real, real world. But I won't go into details with that. Thank you. So I hope you can come and I have a, a question on, on this when you start to control the, the sum of these two cycling loads, more or less. Yes. Uh, you more or less start to synchronize them, I um, guess. They, they, the, the cycling becomes yeah, yeah. connected, more yeah, or less. It's like that uh, when, the, uh, when we use the chiller, uh, we don't use the supermarket, and we use the, this time to store some energy. Yeah. And then uh, we switch to the supermarket system. Could you and say something on, now you have two, so it's obvious when you, someone, one of them does use power, the other shouldn't, or, or uh, so. Yes. But when you increase the number of, of loads that you try to, to aggregate, what happens to this synchronizing? Do you have any feeling for that? If it's mm. easier or more difficult or, or so? Yeah, if we have uh, several units, I guess we can assume uh, all the, if we have two types of the or supermarket and chiller system, I, I guess we can assume all of the supermarket as, the, as a one big supermarket. And I don't see the... Okay, maybe 
Maybe, maybe it's see, or yeah. Okay, we'll see. But with different COP, but yeah. Okay. Perhaps I'm not answering to your question. <laughs> Um, if there is no question, maybe I can ask uh, Torben to come and explain uh, his own system, and then we will be free sooner to go <laughs> lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Move. Move. Yeah. Uh. Why is this always so difficult for everybody, <laughs> including me? Are you still just sitting? Yeah. Wait, sorry. No. Hi there. Andy, ten dollars. Ten kroner. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably supposed to feel a bit weird using one of these. Um, but hello, my name is uh, Tom, and uh, I'm from. Uh, I'm employed at uh, Danfoss Refrigeration and uh, Air Conditioning, and um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about the, the supermarket system as a distributed energy resource. Um, the reason why. Uh, we uh, Danfoss is participating in, uh, in iPower is basically to uh, uh, gain knowledge that enables us to provide uh, the products for the uh, for our customers to uh, smart grid enable their uh, refrigeration systems, and um, the application that we are using is a uh, supermarket refrigeration system. <laughs> Uh, like something like this, which you, I guess you've all seen at least from the sales area side, where we have uh, the display cases where you store food and thereby the thermal capacity, that w w which is what we're effectively uh, utilizing uh, over here to sort of uh, switch uh, time shift. Uh, I hope that's not something we did. Uh, <laughs> uh, <the laughs> with uh, we're, we are utilizing um, it to time shift our energy consumption. What? Okay. So apparently this noise will be over in 30 seconds or something, I've been told. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think I'll try to continue now. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. That was the first, it's the first time I've given a presentation where they decided to try the alarm system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but, um, yeah, where was I? <laughs> uh, the thermal capacity resides in the display cases and out the back we have the uh, compressor system which uh, uses the uh, majority of the energy in, in a system like this. The products that we provide from Danfoss is uh, sort of the controllers, the valves and um, AC drives and sensors, 
and that is sort of basically uh, all the components that uh, we need to run the control system and thereby effectively um, make use of this uh, uh, thermal capacity. So if we take a look at a supermarket refrigeration system from a sort of more uh, schematic uh, point of view, uh, it's comprised of sort of a condensing unit that uh, rejects the heat to the surroundings. It usually resides on the uh, roof of the supermarket. And then we have a compressor rack here, usually a number of compressors that uh, sort of uh, supplies the flow in the system. Or, and as I also mentioned, um, um, is also uh, responsible for the ma majority of the energy consumption of the system. And then we have a number of display cases with uh, individual temperature controllers. Um, uh, here we only have uh, two, and for this to look sort of more like a real supermarket system, we of course not only have chilled, but also a frozen set of display cases. Um, and uh, again, in a real life system, you would have not only four display cases, but a lot of them. So what we are faced with here is a quite distributed control system with individual controllers for each of the, the display cases and each of the compressor racks. Um, how, and, uh, and when we then want to do co uh, power control of this, it's a problem of uh, utilizing the thermal capacity that resides here to basically control how we uh, manage the, uh, the compressors. <coughs> and how does it look? Um, this is the refrigeration lab that we are actually using right now. And uh, we, um, it's, as uh, Samira uh, mentioned, it, uh, it's located at our headquarters in Norbo. And um, as you might be able to see, there is no thermal capacity in all of the display cases. So what we did is that we uh, put in some uh, glycol-filled containers to sort of give us some thermal capacity. It's, of course, not sort of uh, the optimal solution from a uh, uh, seen from a point of view of mapping the real thermal capacity, but it has some uh, practical um, uh, implications uh, that made us uh, implement it in this way. Um, besides that, we, of course, also have some um, compressors. We both have a uh, low temperature compressor rack and a medium temperature compressor rack. And um, even though that some of them are actually controlled by um, a frequency converters so that uh, th they can be continuously controlled, uh, most of them are actually on-off controlled, which is why you'll see uh, some uh, oscillations on the, the, the power consumptions of the system. <coughs> and um, the supermarket as um, a... a uh, uh, distributed energy resources sort of um, has two things I want to talk about. First, of the flexibility and then how we effectively do this power control. Uh, it's important to, to know that uh, a thermal system like a supermarket refrigeration system, the flexibility is uh, highly dependent on uh, both uh, the current state of the system and also the operation con uh, condition of the system. Um, for instance, the, the flexibility will be quite different uh, du during the summertime when there is a high load on the system compared to in the winter when there will be a low load on the system. We cannot just force it to consume um, e energy. So, um, and we can describe that by uh, this, uh, if we look at this curve, which sort of describes the maximum and uh, minimum power consumption of the, the system, where on the x-axis we have the time to saturation, so the time when the system will need to go back to uh, the baseline. And uh, if we ask uh, the system to, to and yeah, I should say on the y-axis, we have the demand adjustment or power adjustment, if you like. So, so if we ask the system to, um, for uh, flexibility with a very long time horizon, then uh, the, 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 we will only be able to come up with an answer that is very close to our baseline because we will not be able to that. That is simply, uh, uh, if it's much longer uh, than uh, the internal uh, time constants. However, if we sort of uh, 
come up with a shorter time to saturation that we need from the system, it becomes better, and sort of eventually it will actually go towards that the maximum power consumption will um, go toward the nominal uh, consumption of the s system and uh, the minimum will go towards zero. However, that's not really that interesting what uh, we can, what the flexibility in is in a very short uh, time frame. So uh, what we is more uh, interesting in is to come up with a setup where we can sort of ask for a particular uh, time um, for uh, minimum power consumption and a p another time for maximum power consumption, and uh, that will then uh, and that's uh, actually what we do in the setup, which is why we have this uh, specific uh, time of duration, uh, time of activation and duration for the supermarket system. So uh, the power control is basically done by uh, manipulating. Uh, the amount of gas that uh, the uh, compressors receive because uh, they sort of consume the amount of uh, the amount of power they consume is based on the amount of gas they have to uh, uh, compress at a given point of time uh, and the, the the way we then do it is that instead of sort of doing directly control of on of the compressors which might be the most intuitive thing we sort of attack the problem from where the uh, cap uh, thermal capacity actually exists, which is in the display cases. So um, if we look at a, t a temperature profile from a, uh, a, d uh, a single display case, uh, remember that uh, in a real system I would have a lot of these sort of in parallel. Uh, the normal way of controlling it is that uh, when we hit the upper constraint of the temperature, we will open the valve, and then the temperature will start. Uh, we'll first see a small overshoot, and then the temperature will start decreasing, meaning that we are producing gas from that particular display case, which goes to the compressor, which then consumes uh, the amount of power required to um, compress that particular uh, amount of gas. And then, when we hit the lower constraint, we will shut off the valve and uh, stop producing gas which will then decrease the consumption of the compressor eventually. And th that happens sort of uh, in parallel with uh, all these uh, different kind of display cases. So if we want to sort of decide when that actually happens, um, what we can do is look at this, uh, the ones that we have running and see that, oh, this one, uh, we can actually uh, switch the state of this prior to when it would actually happen and then um, increase the power consumption. Um, and on the other hand, if, uh, if we uh, shut it off here uh, prior to it hitting the constraint, we will uh, uh, start uh, decreasing the power consumption. This, of course, uh, only works when you have a lot of these uh, display cases. Um, and then eventually we'll stop doing power control and we'll go back to normal operation again for that particular th thing. So. Um, Important properties to remember uh, from a DER perspective of a supermarket is that, as I think also uh, actually one of the comments from uh, David Hill yesterday was that uh, uh, systems are usually built with a uh, primary purpose and the supermarket refrigeration system is to refrigerate the stored goods. So um, temperature uh, security uh, will uh, always have priority. So. Uh, that is also why uh, this, the control structure is uh, in this way that we will always fall back to relying on sort of food uh, safety uh, strategies. Um, and the flexibility, as I mentioned, is uh, really um, dependent on the, uh, the current state of the, the system and also the operation condition. And, um, and with this uh, setup, uh, smart grid uh, integration is, is uh, highly uh, uh, based on uh, ex existing control uh, schemes that we, that we use. Uh, so um, so uh, it's reasonable to assume that it can be uh, uh, th th this strategy can actually be rolled out uh, and uh, retrofitted uh, to, to uh, older systems. And uh, that was what I uh, had to s say about the, 
the supermarket system, and now Casper uh, will tell you about the, the chiller. Kan I ikke høre mig? Nu? Ja. Okay. My name is uh, Kasper Hillerup Lyne, and uh, I come from Grundfos. And I think I did not have my slides on yet, because I think actually this is Torben's slides. So, <laughs> but it's the same, almost the same slide, I'll just shift them around. Uh, let me just... There it is. And... Yes, this is my slides. Yes, as I said, my name is uh, Kasper Hillerup Lyne, and I'm a control engineer in, the, in Grundfos, in the Department of uh, Control Technology. And uh, today I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the other distributed energy resource in this uh, experiment, which, uh, which we provided uh, from Grundfos, and it's uh, standing in Bjergbro, and that's the chiller and uh, ice storage system. So... First of all, Grundfos, many of you know maybe Grundfos, but uh, we are a leading pump manufacturer and we usually associate it with uh, building pumps, as you see here, but uh, Grundfos is going more into expanding into bigger systems, taking more of, the, more of the, the systems that we see out there, not only the pumps. So therefore we decided to go into iPower uh, and demonstrate some of these technologies and one of the things that we're going to we are demonstrating is the full-scale demonstration of a smart grid ready thermal energy storage system for a HVAC application and uh, we decided actually to go all the way and take our own medicine so uh, what we did is that we actually installed the system at our facilities at uh, Bjergbro and uh, this is the two buildings that are being cooled actually right now by the chiller that you see over there uh, and that's the two buildings with a peak load of uh, 300 kilowatts of uh, cooling load. And actually my office is there. So I notice if something goes wrong. So, and this is partly, in this building it's partly uh, process cooling. And in this building it's mostly uh, comfort cooling. And um, so it's, it's used as a, as a living lab for the, for the smart grid technology. So a little bit on into the, the chiller. Uh, the chiller was already present at the, the facilities. And uh, so it's a retrofit. So the original configuration was a direct connection to the building uh, by the chiller. And then we, we modified the existing, syst existing system with the uh, ice tanks and our own controls. And the modifications we have done is that uh, we simply cut the, the pipes here and replaced it with all this. And what it is, is that uh, it's a f flow center, we can call it, it's a kind of, it's a container with a lot of uh, pipes and pumps and uh, valves and sensors. And then two big ice tanks uh, connected to that flow center. And then of course a low level safety controller so that we don't mess up the, uh, the comfort of the, uh, the, the building. And also that we don't stop the, the processes that are going on inside the building. And uh, then we uh, connected it uh, f to the internet, uh, to the aggregator, which uh, Samir has, uh, has shown you. And uh, here is a picture of the actual, actual system. And what we have here is that, uh, if you refer to the other drawing, is that back here in the background, you have the, the chiller, as it was. And these pipes were the pipes, these are the pipes that are going into the building and they were cut, and our flow center, uh, which is this white container, was uh, put in, in between, as to, uh, and then the ice tanks, which are these two, these two was connected uh, through this, uh, this flow center. 
And uh, we have a spare ice tank out there that has been dug up from somewhere, so that's why it looks a little bit... <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the, the basic system. Um, it's an air-cooled propane chiller, that's not so interesting, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, now I'm going a little bit into the details of, uh, of the system as it is. What, what we actually have here, again, referring to the, to the same order of appearance, you say, as, as the previous picture, uh, we have the white container, which is the middle box here, and then you have a ch we have the chiller, and we have the building, and then two ice tanks connected to that. So inside the, the, the white container, we have uh, some things, and the, one of the most important things is this part, an autonomous mixing loop. It's an important uh, thing because it contains a heat exchanger that, uh, that allows sub-zero uh, sub uh, temperatures on one side and then normal uh, positive temperatures on the other side. Uh, and the sub-zero temperatures are, are needed uh, when you need to freeze ice in the ice tanks, but you don't want to, to use water for that because then you will freeze in your pipes and you will break everything. So this autonomous mixing loop is keeping, is guaranteeing that the water will never be frozen no matter what we do with the chiller. So this is part of the, the low-level controller that we really need to implement. And that's, that's very important, as, as Torben said also, that, uh, that uh, the building has priority. So if the aggregator tries to do something crazy, it won't hurt. Uh, yes, the heat exchange I mentioned. And then, of course, uh, there's our pumps, our own pumps, of course a circulation pump in that circulates the brine loop and one for the mixing loop. We could have done it without a pump, but... And then pumps for the ice tank. And you don't know, need to know all the details of all the valves, it's just the general picture, right? And um, just to, to... Whoops, that doesn't look too good. Ah. But uh, what really happens is that there is heat coming from the, uh, the building through the heat exchanger and uh, if the, in this case where the, there's just direct cooling and the ice tanks are not active, that is, we're consuming the base load, which is supposed to be this, this load we see over here on that drawing, then, then all the heat that is going through the, uh, the heat exchanger from the building is just going through the chiller and ejected into the air. Nothing is happening with the ice tanks. The other case, the other mode that we can be in is that all the heat that is going into, through the heat exchanger it's actually going into the ice tanks, melting the ice tank. And as you can see over on the lower left plot uh, here, you see there's the red dot here marks where we began with the ice storage, and now actually it has melted a little bit. So you can see we're actually melting ice at the moment. So this is the mode we are... Uh, this is mode we have been in. We're not in this mode right now. We was in the previous mode now. But and then there's the, the other mode where, we, where we're charging the ice tank. That's not part of, uh, of this. Uh, but, but that's where the chiller is actually extracting heat from both the ice tanks and the, the load that might be from the building. So that's the, the main thing. Uh, also, it's, it's important to note that the CUP of the, chi the chiller, that is the efficiency, is quite low when it's, it's making ice, so, and it's quite high when it's, uh, making, uh, when it's not making ice. And, uh, and actually, it's, uh, it's not on at all when we are melting ice. So. Um, again, the mixing loop is ke keeping the water at the set point here, so the wa there's a set point for the, the building needs a specific temperature that it wants to have. And yes, so, that, so that's basically how it works. But uh, there are some things that are pretty strange to a, uh, to a chiller, uh, to this chiller system, and it, that's especially coming from the fact that it's a retrofit system, so it was not designed for this. But that's, that's probably the way that most smart grid things are going to work anyway, because, yeah. And, uh, yes, the, the, as I said, the internal chiller control was not designed for this, so we are really only able to do either full charge, full discharge, or direct cooling. In principle, if you did it in, the, in, a, in a more thorough way and we designed the system ourselves, we could do continuous control, but not in this case. And also, as you see over here on the top left plot here, you can see that there's actually a delay from when, when the chiller is asked to do something until it actually does it. You see there's a delay here. And that's also a, a, a consequence of, of using this retrofitted uh, system. 
because it takes a little bit of time to, to actually realize that it needs to do something. And uh, as uh, Samira was, uh, was uh, mentioning, a, a, a chiller can't tolerate going on and off too much. So even though that's the only mode we can actually use, we can't do it too often. That will, that will wear out the compressor and not be efficient at all. And then there's another, as Samira also pointed out, the ice tanks are very, very well insulated. So they will lose about, in the summer heat, they will lose a charge in a month. So it will take quite a long time. So it's around uh, one megawatt hour of uh, storage in these two tanks. And that can cover around 75% uh, of the peak in the summer period. So right now they can cover it all for five, four or five hours. So that's quite a lot of energy actually you can shift around, but not so fast always as you see here. So as you see, it's very different from the supermarket in many ways. Uh, so that, that's what make it, makes it complicated to aggregate all these things. And um, yeah, that's, I guess that's really what I wanted to say about the chiller. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess Samia will continue a little bit with, uh, with her slides. Uh, you will switch to yeah. actually I would like to stop the test right now because they are doing good and I'm nervous what happens in the next 10 minutes um, but uh, as I expect uh, you like thermal storage and you didn't go for break so um, let me just uh, say a bit about the aggregator setup. The first item is the model of the consumption units. And uh, in our setup, we assume some simple, simplified model of the units. Why? Because of these uh, reasons, you can see. First of all, is the computational uh, complexity. If we uh, use complex model, this uh, will increase the computational complexity and this makes the time we need to uh, define uh, this power friends uh, unacceptable uh, in practice when we want to aggregate many uh, units. Uh, the second reason is the uh, information encapsulation. If we use a complex model, then we need to use, uh, we need to exchange more information and uh, then the information encapsulation will be difficult. And the last reason is the uh, separation of uh, responsibility. The, the aggregator would not intend and it's the out of the uh, scope of uh, the aggregator's responsibility to uh, control uh, the consumers in detail like every pumps or every valve. So the aggregator actually uh, doesn't need the, a complex model of the system. So uh, what we assume in our setup is that, uh, as you can also see, uh, here uh, we assume the consumer, uh, that, uh, which are basically thermal energy storage, uh, as energy collector uh, in a way that they, uh, we can describe the salient feature of the TS uh, thermal energy storage. So uh, the, uh, we can model it in this way that uh, we have uh, some limitation on the capacity, uh, we have uh, some li uh, limitation on the uh, power we can input to the system, uh, also conversion from uh, electrical uh, power to the thermal power uh, can be done with different rates uh, which will lead to different COP of the system and we might have leakage uh, uh, to the surrounding and uh, we uh, have also uh, some limitation on the input valve which means uh, we have limitation in uh, uh, we have some run-stop constraint, as I explained, uh, for the chiller system. 
So uh, basically, the last level of uh, complexity uh, we can assume to model the thermal uh, storage is the piecewise linear system, and we assume two linear system. Uh, in order to model the uh, behavior, uh, for example, like chiller system, we have two different modes or for uh, this match the reality very well. Uh, for supermarket system, the COP during the daytime and the nighttime uh, will be uh, much uh, different. So in this way, we can uh, model these also dynamics. And this uh, model, uh, is uh, subject to the constraint, uh, input constraint, which means the con uh, constraint on the power, state constraint, which means, for example, in supermarket, the uh, temperature limits, uh, and uh, in the chiller system, uh, the ice tank capacity. And uh, we also have, a, we also include run stop constraint, and with these two conditions, uh, we never uh, ask the chiller to switch on and uh, to be switched on and off uh, very often. And the last item is the optimization problem at the aggregator. Uh, uh, we assume uh, mm, some uh, MPC controller at the aggregator, and uh, uh, since we have uh, this constraint and uh, because of the model, uh, this will lead to some mixed integer MPC design at the aggregator, and uh, at each sampling time, we want to minimize the deviation uh, from the baseline. Uh, I guess you know about the MPC controller, but it's like that at each sampling time, we have a, a power prediction, and we just apply the first one. And based on this power prediction, we also can provide the information that the units needs during the activation. <laughs> So that's it. Uh, I would like to say thank you to the contributors to this uh, demo. First of all, my uh, supervisor, uh, Jan Dimon Benson, the Alberg University. Uh, Oliver uh, also helped us a lot uh, to make connection uh, between the things here. Uh, I would like also to say thank you to my uh, previous supervisor, Jakub Stostrup. He's not here right now, he's in the US. But the, the idea of demonstrating these things uh, was from him in the first time. And also, uh, Hakan at Confos. That's, that's all. Thank you. Very convincing, Samira. Thank you very much for a very good demonstration. Well planned as well, and everything worked fine. So congratulations with that. Uh, it's we we will be done in just few samples, which means two or three minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> stay here. There's probably some questions. Yes. Everything was very convincing. Okay. Frank Ellison from the Danish Technological Institute. Um, the uh, desired uh, power from the supermarket. It, uh, from here, it looks a bit fluctuating. Can you tell me a bit more on how you calculate that, or? Uh, the desired power. Yes, b uh, the desired power is fluctuating because uh, uh, the parameters uh, of the supermarket are also changing during the activation. This minimum power, maximum power, and uh, also the uh, mm, available capacity for up-regulating and down-regulating. But for the chiller system, it's kind of fixed, uh, this minimum and maximum power. That's why we might have some uh, uh, fluctuation in the desired power from the supermarket system. And other than this, uh, when the problem is uh, getting infeasible, uh, uh, we switch to another controller. We just uh, send the uh, previous power. This also could be a reason. Thank you. Dieter from IBM, yes. um, have you done or will you do some uh, economic uh, analysis, quantitative analysis of the value of this regulation power versus the, the capex and the operational cost of uh, this extra equipment? Um, you mean in uh, dollar or e euro or? In Danish kroner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would like to be more international, uh, but in 
not specifically in, uh, in money, in Danish corona or what other currency, but uh, in theoretical stuff, uh, we assume uh, the value of the flex. We, as we uh, define the fle flexibility of system as the energy that is stored. And in theoretical stuff, we assume to optimize the energy we consume. So the uh, cost function uh, we want to uh, optimize in theoretical stuff uh, is different from what uh, we uh, tried here. And there, uh, so I, I, I think we can map the energy consumption to the Danish corona. If Maybe I have a little bit of a comment on that also. Uh, this is mainly a technology project. Um, of course, also, you can uh, focus on the, the economics in it, but just the fact that you invest in, uh, in, in big, big ice tanks and custom systems makes it a little bit hard. But I know that, uh, in, that Silas Harbo uh, from... Uh, Energinet, uh, sorry, yeah, Dansk Energi, sorry, sorry. Silas Harbo has uh, has is doing some work in in these uh, these business cases. So, and uh, actually, after lunch, there will be a, a talk on how uh, the business case looks for the supermarket uh, side of it. So, uh, there is uh, people looking into the economics of it. Yes, the activation is also finished, and uh, <laughs> yes, you can see we melt this amount of ice <laughs> at the chiller, and uh, the available flexibility at the end for a supermarket is like this, uh, different from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, we were below the maximum power for almost all the time. Yes, thank you. And so there's lunch until one thirty.
Yes, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Please be seated and be quiet, both, please. Um, a lot of you have been asking whether the presentations and the video will be available at the, uh, at the iPowernet, and of course it will be in due time. Uh, we still need some of the presentations, and uh, the video has to be um, well, finished, finalized. Um, and uh, there will also be a participants list at the, uh, at the web. So, the first presentation after lunch will be Morten Stry from the Danish Energy Association. We'll give uh, more information about the flexibility from a supermarket. Go okay. for it, Morten. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you had a pleasant lunch. And um, my name is Morten Stry from the Danish Energy Association. And I would tell you something about value of flexibility from, from supermarket refrigeration. And as we learned before the break, there is a lot of technical um, demonstration going on within supermarket flexibility. So we have tried to make an initial study on what is potential value of, of this flexibility. And it works. Great. So this is what I'll go through today. Um, the objective of this small study, um, and then see what, what do we look at in this uh, case study compared to the rest of the electrical system and, and, and energy markets, and um, give an introduction to supermarkets in Denmark, and then I'll present some of uh, the scenarios we have looked at. Um, I'll go through the, the way we have um, calculated revenue from these supermarket and the costs of mobilizing the flexibility from the supermarkets and look at the different scenarios, how they compare when you look at the economic performance and then try to summarize the lesson learned. So basically we want to describe the technical concept and the economic value of flexible uh, supermarket refrigeration in Denmark and try to answer these questions, how much flexible consumption is, is out there and um, what is the value of it, at least part of the value. So this was done as a case study where we looked at what, how can we say something general about mobilizing supermarkets. So it's a, it's a cooperation between Danish Energy Association and the uh, Danish Technology Institute and Danfoss and University of Aalborg and also Superkøl Eco Central, which is a service provider within the supermarket industry. They monitor temperatures and provide also some hardware for supermarkets. And uh, they should, this setup should help us to look at what is the cost of mobilizing uh, flexibility in, in these scenarios. And also a major outcome should be what is the key focus area for continuous analysis. For instance, market barriers and, and which business opportunities out there. So um, not to repeat too many of the previous presentations, I'll jump through this quite quickly since <laughs> Lars Henrik, for instance, gave a, a quite nice introduction. But up here you see there are some, some demanders for, for flexibility, and here you have the providers, for instance, these units here, and they could be supermarkets. Uh, they have some markets they can demand the flexibility on. And then there are some roles here, for instance, an uh, aggregator, which Samir uh, carefully explained how they can function. And they can also be what you could call, I choose to call this a commercial VPP, um, I'll try to define it a bit more, but basically it's about aggregating what is the flexibility there and bringing it to these markets where you can trade it. There can be other providers up here that can also provide flexibility. Then the markets will sort out who will be activated and then the activation go through the aggregator and to this commercial VVP and then to the units that will in the end provide the service. And then there will be some data exchange between these different uh, entities. But this, co this case study will only focus on this part of this entire process here. So we will look at, at the cost and, and revenues that you can look in in, the, in this framework. Um, but the commercial VPP is, is an interesting player here because it possesses some existing customer and business relation to the supermarket owners and they have already hardware and software uh, Supply, supplying experience and they have existing IT communication to these supermarkets because they do their main business which is monitoring the temperature and they also have some uh, external control capabilities of the supermarkets. So 
so, th so they are this, this key player in, in making this mobilization uh, strategy possible. Uh, they could be at least. And of course, other commercial VPPs can exist, coexist, and other aggregators. So basically, if you look at the, at the supermarkets in Denmark, they, there's roughly 4,500 of them, and they have some very, very large ones, but they are few. And then, of course, you see the distribution here. So a large part of the supermarkets are within the small and medium scale and judged by their flexibility of installed capacity. So we have developed some scenarios that we look at. Scenario two and three, we look at small supermarkets here, um, actually within the same chain of supermarkets. And scenario one, we look at uh, try to give an estimate of a broader uh, portfolio with more uh, diversified um, supermarkets. And what you can expect in the end of this presentation is this graph again. So basically, we will have some scenarios, and the idea is that we will try to estimate what is uh, investment and operating costs, so making them flexible, and what can be the revenue. I will not go into detail here. I'll try to sp spend the rest of the presentation uh, telling about some of the assumptions, how to get there. So basically, we, have, we had to focus on some of the ways you can make value out of flexibility. So here are some of the services that the mind response can supply. Well, we've heard a lot about the DSO services. Um, for this analysis, we have said there is no market at the moment, so it's hard to put a price on it. Uh, so we jumped to then the DSO services, which, for instance, could be a value on peak capacity. And we see a development in Denmark as well, uh, that there will be a strategic reserve in place in 2016, which will put a value on uh, reducing your load in some peak hours. But uh, for this study, we've actually focused on regulating power market, mainly because it's, it does exist at the moment, and it also service you find all over Europe. And uh, you can increase, you can expect to see increasing balancing need with more, and more wind and solar in the system. So there will be a use for this service for, for the years to come. Um, spot market, again, we are dealing with supermarkets, and the flexibility might not be so long, so it, there not be so much economic incentive in shifting the load from one hour to the other. Frequency control, uh, they have a high reservation price per megawatt, but unfortunately, uh, it's still not really demonstrated how you can participate as a, as a portfolio of, of many units to provide these services. And also, the, the, the market volume and the development prices seems to be, well, the development is, is a bit uncertain in the future, and, and the volume is small. So we have defined these scenarios for, for, for this analysis. We have said the one design parameter should be what is a smart grid control at the supermarket. If we look at one way to go, we have high, um, high control saying that the control systems, they are over time being replaced by something that has a smart grid capability. Second way is to say, okay, we need uh, the commercial VPP and there. Um, infrastructure to, to provide us with some of these forecasts and portfolio control because there will not be so much uh, local uh, smart grid control installed. So then we have to find these three scenarios. One is we look at uh, an organic development where we over a 10 years period assume that many of these supermarkets will be reinstalled the control systems and they will be upgraded naturally. So this is not included in the business case. This is paid by, uh, well, you could say a separate business case. And we look at 2,000 units here. So second scenario is that we see fast development, so quite rapidly. Um, but also, we need to install this flexibility in, in, in each supermarket. And we look at a portfolio of, of 230 units, roughly. And the third scenario is we look also at fast development. But here, again, the commercial VPP plays a role. And we look at the same portfolio of 230 units. So what are the similarities between these uh, things of these scenarios, not just looking at the time and, and, and unit size. So again, there's, there's a difference in control system. Is it, is it included in the scenario? Uh, well, here you have in the need of additional box inst installed. For instance, something that Torben has explained, how you can upgrade these kind of systems to, to provide some of these services. Um, who will provide the prognosis of the flexibility of the supermarket? Well, here you have an ups upgrade of the control system that is more smart grid enabled. So this intelligence is already built in, and it's in place at the supermarket. And the same goes with the scenario two, whereas the commercial VPP has to provide this kind of, of prognosis based on his existing knowledge of the supermarkets. 
Um, and then again, how, homo how homogeneous is this portfolio? Well, it has the same control system in scenario one, but in scenario two, it's got the same unit size. These units are all small, and the electric uh, installations are all in the same order, uh, well, uh, done the same way, which is also good for the, for the cost of mobilizing. And uh, the control systems here are not really enabled for smart grid operation, but at least they are the same. So they are some, so they are chosen based on they shouldn't have too high cost to mobilize. Um, and then for, yeah, who will provide these prognosis and activate the flexibility, you see the different roles here that has to be, that has to take care of this job in the different scenarios. So how, how to calculate the revenue then? Um, we have defined these scenarios here based on the number and type of supermarkets in the portfolio. And this will provide us with uh, the total yearly um, <coughs> electricity use for cooling in the supermarkets. And at the same time, we can say, what is the compressor um, power then? Not just the yearly electricity use, but also hour per hour um, consumption from the compressors. Uh, since we learned this is where the flexibility is. Then we can add some of the barriers that we've seen. There's an energy storage in these systems, and we have defined a few cases to see how does this affect the, the revenue if you have a high or small energy storage and regulation, and how, how, is, how does the regulation affect this flexibility that is uh, available at portfolio scale. So, and then to put a price on it, we've looked at how does uh, hourly up and down regulation price in 2013 in Denmark look like for the regulating power market and the spot prices. And then from this, we have said there's a profit to be made in some hours, and this is what drives the business case, the revenue. And then I'll go through some of these, uh, I'll go through this methodology in the coming slides. So first we'll start out by looking at this model that can basically go from uh, overall estimation of where does uh, the supermarket consume its power. You see this is the entire uh, division of, of electricity consumption. And this is a part that is uh, roughly related to the cooling. And there you see approximately 60% of this is, is uh, compressor power. And then from previous studies, we know that there is a good correlation between how does the uh, compressor power relate to the outdoor temperature and the opening hours. So by applying a temperature curve from 2013, we have, we have then um, this um, deviation of, of power consumption over the year, um, which is an input to, to, the, to the revenue estimation. And this goes for the small portfolio size of 230 units. So from the yearly consumption, we go to this um, power consumption per hour, and you see it peaks around 6, six megawatt. Um, if you look at the larger portfolio, we can again do the same calculation, and then we end up with a portfolio that consumes roughly a peak load of 70 uh, megawatt. So again, the energy storage has um, what you've seen the last five, six, five, six years. So. Uh, given there's this profit to be made per hour, we multiply this by the um, flexible power that we have calculated from, um, from the compressor power consumption and then apply these uh, boundaries from the energy storage to give us a, an estimate of how much revenue is to be made from these different portfolio sizes. And the uh, results look like this. You see there is um, portfolio revenue from the small portfolio uh, in, in kroner per year, and you see the energy storage of the supermarket is represented here at the x-axis, so different sizes. And what we actually know something about, uh, this dot here, for instance, which is a low-case storage estimation based on uh, existing supermarkets and their existing co control strategy. So this gives us an idea that this is a, an energy storage of this size. Alternatively, we can rely on some simulations model that will show how, what is the storage depending on some more optimistic temperature boundaries that we will have to stay within. But uh, the existing energy storage, which of course is this temperature boundary which we can, we can choose to stay within, they give us this amount of, of, of revenue you see here. Whereas the rest of the revenue up to this upper boundary here 
is basically lost because of the way the activating prices are in, in the regulating power market. So there can be cons consecutive, no, what is it called? Hours in a row <laughs> where you have different, uh, where you have upregulating prices. And of course, you can only move your consumption that much, then you have to stop, and then you can't make that revenue possible. Um, so you have, um, you have the, you are, your energy storage limits your ability to make all the profit in the market that's out there. So you can't continue to, buy, to provide the service for many hours in a row. Um, so basically these value here, they would require additional uh, energy storage. Um, these these uh, are results of a strategy where you basically just have everything you got and you bid it into the market at any hour. If you alternatively only bid half of what you have to stay longer uh, before you saturate, you'll see that there will be a slightly higher revenue if you have a low energy storage, but you will see a lower potential with higher energy storage. So there can be different strategies that you can look more into if you like to optimize the revenue. Um, at the cost side, we have looked at this methodology. Basically, we have our scope of case study here, and um, we have tried to go into detail with what are the costs of providing, um, especially the forecasting of the commercial VPP and the activation here, what, sh what software cost do we look into, and at each supermarket, what, um, what is the cost of these new uh, control equipment and electric meters and IT communication. And uh, this will give us a uh, portfolio cost per year. So these are depending on the size of the portfolio and, and, also, um, and also the nature of how much equipment do we need to install in different scenarios. And then there are some market participation requirements for the regulating power market that I will like, uh, briefly go through here. There is a quite interesting report explaining some of the barriers that demand response face when they should engage in the, participate in the regulating power market. Um, and they have a number of suggestions how to overcome these barriers. And I'll just mention two of them. For instance, one is the minimum bid size that you need to, to uh, fulfill. And this was already reduced to one megawatt from 10 megawatts. So this is an advantage for demand response. First and second of all, you also need to be, uh, today you need to verify according to five minutes baseline. And it's suggested that you can verify based on a uh, high resolution of electricity meter. Uh, the electricity meter should have a, at least five minute resolution. Um, so this is basically what we assume in this business case study that this needs to be in place to participate in this market. And basically we also need to have some of these barriers solved out, but for, for, for this study it's mainly the cost of, of, the, of the meters that we've been interested in. So looking at what were the conclusion of, of this uh, cost of the cost drivers um, for scenario one. We have assumed that this update of the supermarket control system is in place, so that is not a big, this, this, we haven't really put any price on this, we just assume this needs to be in place. In scenario two, there was of course uh, smart grid boxes that, that contribute to the total cost. And then for scenario three, it's mainly the cost of developing some software at the commercial VPP to be able to provide the forecast and activation of supermarkets. Then at the, each supermarket, we have uh, looked at this demand for five minute resolution, and this adds to the to cost of, of meters that needs to be installed in each supermarket. And also some of the supermarkets, they need to have separation of how the electrical installation is, is performed at the moment. So this also contributes to some cost in the scenarios. We also found that the commercial VPP role here, uh, the, the company already have a lot of internet communication in place, so this has not been a, a big issue to, to get this going. So this basically, this has not uh, added any cost to the scenarios. So to compare the cost and, uh, and revenue, we've used this normal uh, way of, of um, representing the, the implementation time in the scenarios from one to from three to 10 years in the different uh, portfolios, and then compare what is uh, the difference between cost and revenue per year, and then discounted this to, to compare the scenarios. And we look at this kind of, of, um, of energy storage in the, 
in the supermarket um, because they all have different revenues per year, but we look at, at this one for the, for the net present value analysis. And basically, uh, we get to the first image again of the presentation. We see that scenario one has a, a positive value if you say this is a net present value of the, K of the investment and the operating cost and the revenue cost from participating in the regulating power market. Um, scenario two, on the other hand, they have a, a negative value, so they don't have this enough revenue to, to meet the cost of mobilizing according to, to this strategy where you, on a short-term basis, install boxes to be able to, to control the supermarkets. And scenario three also have a, a, a negative overall value so if you, com if you compare the time development of how CAPEX and, and OPEX and, and the revenue is uh, based on the assumption, of course, that we've made, you see that the scenario one, where you have a organic development, a long-term development of, of upgrading the system, and this does not impact the business case of the smart, of the smart grid uh, control and, and flexibility, uh, this shows potential to have the best payback basically because it's the cheapest way to mobilize it. And the other ones where you have uh, alternative ways to mobilize how you can control these uh, supermarkets, they seem not to be able to provide a positive value. So basically the value in the market, based on and all the assumptions that we've made, they cannot pay back what, it's, what is needed, um, looking only at this market service. Because obviously, what we need is, of course, to get a quite good estimate about how much flexibility is out there in, in real operation, what are the real temperature boundaries, and, and how, can we make this, how can we make this work. And then, as we learned, the energy storage size is, is key to how much can we regulate these uh, units and how, much, uh, can, how, ma how many activations can we, can we carry out per year and how much revenue can we make. Um, obviously, also a lesson is that we need to be able to look at more market uh, services you can provide and thereby also expanding. Uh, it would be a good idea to expand the way we, we calculate the value of the flexible power. And this, this involves, of course, looking at other services that could be provided by, by supermarkets and other kind of, of uh, flexible demand. Um, this was an initial, an initial study, so we need to dig more into details about what will be the software cost to make this uh, commercial VPP capable of providing the, the, um, the, f the forecast of flexibility per supermarket and also to activate the flexibility. Uh, we have some initial uh, cost estimates that we put into this study, but this needs to go into more detail in the future. And also to include maybe a scenario where we look at a larger portfolio controlled by a, a commercial VPP. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, the key is to look, at least in a Danish perspective, to the attractive business case. How can we match the mobilization cost of the flexibility with the value that is in the, in, in the market uh, to make something that, that uh, commercial players will, will like to participate in? And at, at this stage, it seems like it's the organic development that we look into that there should be these things in place due to other reasons or regulation. And then uh, on top of that, you can make a business case of, of, of then operating the flexibility and bidding it into the market. Um, so the requirement would obviously be for, for, for supermarket in specific to have these uh, smart grid systems installed and, and also the meters to have the right functionality to be able to participate in, these, uh, in this regulating power market. And then looking into further work could also be to see how can, um, how can we solve these market barriers and actually make it possible uh, to, to engage in the market in a very easy way and a way that suits the, the characteristics of demand response. And you could also look into who should then make these investments in, uh, in the equipment and meters and who will make the money in the end, and how can this be distributed in a way that it actually makes sense, so it's uh, attractive for all partners. And then looking at, from the business side, how can this smart, how can this flexibility business fit into the existing business of, of, um, of these service providers that are needed to reduce the cost of, of, of mobilizing supermarket flexibility. 
think that was it. Yes, uh, the big issue is, of course, where's the money? So, well, you're trying to, to lift some of the questions, but there are probably other questions for Morten, yes? I'm Morten as well, I'm from TSO, CSNV. Are you uh, putting the same product on the market during summertime as in wintertime? I guess you can't squeeze the same, same energy into and out of the system during summertime than in wintertime. No, no we can't. It's a, the product, well the volume that you can bid into the market is determined by the compressor power state at that point of view, uh, at this point in time. So it's matching the prices in individual hours with the compressor power for downregulation and upregulation potential. This is then the upregulation, downregulation potential is then multiplied by how much is paid for one hour of uh, flexibility in that, in that market. So it does take into account that you can't uh, consume a lot during winter and you can't, uh, you can't ex extend your uh, consumption range in the summertime. And this is also where you see these saturation hours where you have several hours of activation in a row and you lose quite a lot of money because you can't be activated in all of them. You mentioned that you are considered to put this into the ancillary <coughs> markets, to the ancillary markets for, for ancillary services. Have you also considered to put it into an intraday market or something with a BHP? Yeah, um, it would, it would of course be relevant also to because it's it's basically the same purpose. You you want you like to have balancing within the hour, and they are kind of alternatives to each other as I see them. So obviously the ELBES market would also be a, a great fit for, for this kind of flexibility. Um, I haven't looked into the data, the, the prices in this market, but it's uh, y y taking into account you can't sell the, the product twice. So you need to, of course, be able to, to respect that you can't trade the same volume on both uh, regulating power market and ELBES, but there will be uh, it, it will be an increasing value revenue if you look into both markets, and that's why the cross market would be interesting to to take into a next step of the analysis. The next speaker this morning, uh, this this afternoon, will be Mo Thomas Busk Espersen from the Insira Software. Uh, yesterday, you gave a very short presentation about the small village in the middle part of, of Jutland, but now you'll give a real demo uh, about Live Lab in Stemmerup. So, the floor is yours. Yes, and can you hear what I say? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I just find my presentation somewhere up here. Yeah, uh, I like it. Yes, and thank you for staying. Uh, you saw me a little yesterday, and for those who were not here yesterday, I will recap some of the stuff I said yesterday, and for some of those that were asleep yesterday, it might be a good opportunity to, to hear once more. My name is Thomas Esperson, and I work with Encero Software, which is a part of uh, the Encero uh, company in Horsens. Uh, what I will touch upon today is uh, uh, again, a very brief uh, description of uh, the Encero Live Lab that we have built uh, just south of Horsens. Uh, I will just give a short demo of, uh, of our uh, platform, uh, take a look at some of the results that we have from, from the Live Lab, and uh, then uh, make a springboard to the to demonstration after here where we're going to demonstrate the FLEC uh, platform uh, as well. If we have time, I will just say a few words about Encero here at the end. Encero Live Lab uh, is built uh, with funding from Encero and uh, from a EU-funded project called Finesc, uh, where we are uh, trying to incorporate some of these new uh, future internet uh, smart utility services that has been uh, developed in, uh, in, a, in this project. 
this is a quite large project with six European uh, sites. Uh, Malmö in Sweden is one of them, Amsterdam in Holland, uh, Madrid in uh, Spain, and of course Horsens in, uh, in Denmark. Oop. And uh, for those of you who don't know where Horsens is, it's uh, approximately the same latitude as Risø. Uh, so what I'm going to show here is that we can aggregate uh, different devices on, on this latitude. Uh, usually we call this uh, in zero country in, uh, in our backyard, so, and we have chosen this uh, small city called Stenerop. It's, it's actually a, a village uh, located down here uh, south of, uh, of Horsens. And here we have uh, chosen 20 families in and around the village, most of them in the, in the center of the village, and uh, with them we have uh, uh, installed a, a series of devices uh, uh, that I will look into in a, in a second. The idea is that we are going to both test the user experiences from these families, how do they interact with new technologies, and, and how uh, uh, do they react to to this future world that they hopefully are going to participate in with respect to, to smart grid. This is just a closer look at a, a standard up, and what we have installed is all houses have been equipped with, with solar panels, all houses have been equipped with, with some kind of a heat pump, all houses have been equipped with an electric vehicle, and of course all houses have also been uh, uh, have access to, to a, a, a portal or a web page where they can see the consumption and see what's, uh, what is uh, uh, being produced from their, from their solar panels and what is being used in, in uh, charging the vehicle. And I'll show some of these results later. Uh, this is uh, a small project in the, the big world, but uh, is a large project for us, of course has opened a lot of doors, not only to, to the local community in Horsens, which has been very important for the, for the NZERO, as it is part of our, our uh, yeah, idea in, in, in being local and, and global at the same time. So we have opened up for, for all our families, or the community just south of Horsens, had a, got a lot of a good press, both locally in the local newspapers, but also in, the, in television. Uh, gotten involved with a, a lot of, of uh, suppliers of uh, equipment, and of course we have uh, uh, now also participated in, in uh, some of these uh, large EU-funded projects and are now also engaged with, with some of the universities, the local university in, in the Eastern Jutland and with the University of Southern Denmark as well. So it has opened a lot of doors for us uh, building this uh, small uh, village. It's up and running. It's been up and running since uh, since January. Most uh, gear was installed in uh, in uh, uh, October, November, December last year, and uh, we now almost have one year of uh, of uh, measurements from the from the city, or from the village. So now it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Oh, somebody can read. Lovely. <laughs> uh, oh, it should be okay. No? Ah, very good. It's still a comma. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> so we made it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the platform, and I'll just show you. Uh, a few glimpses of what is happening in here uh, with respect to, to the monitoring and, uh, and uh, the collect collection of, uh, of, uh, of data. Uh, uh, so I will actually skip right to 
this one where we monitor the houses. And that's, that is always interesting because now I've been focusing a little on this all morning. And uh, it's now that you say that red is good, green is bad. <laughs> but that is, of course, not the truth. Uh, right now, I can see that we are not, uh, not uh, connected to, to most of the houses. But these are a, a brief overview of, of uh, all the houses that we ha have out there. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we are collecting of data, um, if we go in here and to the first house. So we have a whole suite of, uh, of data. This is primarily related to the, to the heat pump. Uh, and you can see that we have received the last value here at 2 o'clock, which is about 10 minutes ago. So that's a little late. And that might be why it is, it's actually red. Uh, some gear is up and some is not. We have the charger uh, for the, for the uh, electric vehicle here. We have a, a smart meter here where we measure from the, from the power going in and out of the, the house. And finally, we also have some uh, comes from, uh, uh, heat meter measuring for also on the, on the heat pump. Uh, all in all, I think we have about 30, between 25 and 30 uh, measuring points in each house. Uh, and even though that is only, only uh, 20 houses, it's quite a lot of data, especially because some of it is, uh, we had just an input of live data there. We receive uh, live data from, from some of these devices every 10 seconds. So, so it's a lot of data building up, a lot of data to, to, get, to, get, uh, to organize and, and make sure that we, we know it all. I'll just show you another uh, brief picture here of uh, what we're doing. Yeah, here you can see we're actually working both on, on the, the live lab, which is the other one, on the uh, DTC, which is the Green Tech Center near Weile. Uh, and uh, then finally, we have a link out here to, to the Flex House in the, in the backyard of, of this. Um, in, the, in the Green Tech Center, we are collecting data from uh, two energy Gills and, uh, and the, uh, the office building itself down there. But for this purpose, I think we should just take a look at the live lab house here. And there's the greenhouse, <laughs> which is always nice. Uh, just again, a brief overview of what's, what's going on. Uh, you can very fast track down and see this is a good house. <laughs> uh, And you can, again, very easily find which, uh, which device is up and running and when we did we receive the, the latest data. And uh, in this case, it's also around 2 o'clock, 2.11 here for some of these data. So it is, it's live and it's up and running. If we take a look at a, on a bad house, which is maybe also of good interest, we can see uh, this house is, is bad, but primarily because uh, we are missing some, uh, some measurements from some indoors and outdoors temperatures. So not that critical, but uh, uh, of course it looks very red when you look at it from this point of view here. Yeah. Uh, this platform is, is a base for what we're going to show as well uh, this afternoon when we are going to use it in, in relation to the, to the FLEC uh, demonstration. Uh, So let's get back to the presentation here. And I'll show some, some results we have from out there. As you see, we have live data coming in. This is a good day, you can see. These are all greened. Uh, we have all the historic data, all the historic data, and then we are monitoring on all these different devices. And uh, as I told you, it was a, it's a hell of a lot of, of data coming in. Uh, and what we're using for right now is a uh, designing this aggregator platform. Uh, we have set up some, uh, some uh, objectives that we want to, to optimize for, uh, a simple CO2 emission reduction for the houses so that the user in the house can say, I want to be as green as possible, a 
energy bill optimizer where we can, you can optimize on electricity price or tariffs, if, if that's the case. Uh, a optimizing algorithm looking for is, uh, are you producing solar power, power yourself? They are very, uh, uh, very interested in that and instead of they all have solar panels and of course want to use their own solar power so that it doesn't spill to the, to the grid. And uh, what we're going to see later on today is, uh, is this uh, uh, power grid uh, uh, optimizer where we try to, to shift some of the load from, uh, from the electric vehicles. Ah, I don't, don't need to walk forth and back with us. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday uh, saw uh, Jonas Brandt uh, tell from, uh, from Kampstrup uh, tell about the, the eButtler interface. We are using that as well uh, for both the comfort levels in the house and for the EV charging uh, levels. And uh, to make this more understandable, we are for the, for the comfort, we are allowing the user to set a minimum, an optimum, and a max temperature in his house so that he can slide these bars forth and back in the software and adjust that. With respect to the EV charger, we allow them to set a minimum charge, which is the, the charging level that we want, that the user wants his EV to be charged to as soon as he gets back, ho back home. Uh, I think uh, that uh, you once called it uh, an emergency uh, charge so that you can reach the hospital or uh, whatever you need to be sure that you can reach uh, when you get back home. And then we have two, two bars that can set uh, the charge level for your weekdays and your weekends and when it has to be fully charged. So our controls very basically is composed by a primary objective, some user settings and some online measurements. And uh, to make this more digestible, we can say that, uh, yeah, we want to manage the load and the grid. And there are some comfort uh, levels from the user. We have the, the, uh, the power, we know the, the, the uh, consumption of the EV charger, and we have a, a record of the, of the battery's uh, state of charge. And uh, totally practical it could be that uh, we don't want to, to charge between uh, 5 in the evening and 8 in the evening. We want the car charged to a certain minimum, and it must be fully charged uh, by tomorrow morning at 6.30, and uh, that, during that, we, with that, we build a, a schedule that we send out to, to each of the, of the cars in the, in the grid out there. Actually, we recalculate this scheme every five minutes, and that's, of course, a, a hassle, uh, and uh, currently we are discussing whether we should reduce that to every 15 minutes. If we take a look at the, some of the results out there, we have a, over here taking a 10 houses uh, from, uh, from Stenorup, and uh, this is the, the power running from the grid into the, to these houses. This is the, the solar power generated over, it's, by the way, it's over a full week uh, with a Monday and a Sunday down here. And uh, finally, we have some uh, power spilled back into the, to the grid, and of course, uh, this is not uh, very economically wise for, for the, for the uh, users out in, in Stenorp. Uh, I mark here with the gray lines the, the peak period from uh, 5 o'clock to approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. From this, you can easily calculate the actually uh, power consumption in the houses. And uh, this is where you always will look for, for this peak uh, in the evening, this evening peak, uh, and which should be lying in, in between these gray lines. And we don't actually see that that uh, clearly, but it is there. And uh, if we break this down for these into to the power use for cooking, uh, 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 for uh, television, for Xbox, and, uh, and lightning, uh, lightning and stuff like that in the house, uh, if it looks like, look like this. If we add on the, the heat pumps uh, consumption, it would look like this. And finally, if we add on the, the EV, you can clearly see that people get back home in the afternoon, plug in their electric vehicle, and, uh, and it will start uh, charging. Uh, 
this uh, picture actually looks very much like the one that uh, Lars, Hent Lars Henrik Hansen showed, uh, the schematic figure on how, how does uh, a, a future world with, with uh, heat pumps and uh, electric vehicle looks in, in real life. So it mimics that very, very well. Uh, this is a, a period in the beginning of, of October, and, and here we can see that almost half of the, the consumption is used in the house, uh, and only 31% uh, is used actually on the, on the heat pumps. So uh, what is it that we want? Of course, we, everybody has been discussing, can we actually move some of the load from the peak into other hours? And that is, of course, what, is, uh, uh, what this is all about, uh, seen from our perspective. So what have we actually done? Now I've fast forwarded nearly a month to the beginning of October. If you first step back a little, uh, it is very clear that uh, it has become a lot colder. So the heat pump is running a lot more and using a lot more uh, electricity. Uh, what we also see is that uh, uh, that the overall consumption a month later is uh, increased with about 20%. And actually, the, in the peak period, we have an increase of 30% of, uh, of, the, of the consumption of the power. Um, and that is, of course, because it's been substantially colder uh, during this month, and we're using a lot more energy to, to heat the houses. Uh, so what do we do? Have we done anything here? <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, uh, this Friday and this Saturday uh, in this week, we had the, the algorithm running and tried to, to see if we could shift some of the load uh, for, uh, from, the, from the electric vehicle. And uh, to some extent, you see something. <laughs> if we take the Friday first, what you definitely don't see is that there is any shift in the, in the in the uh, power for the uh, power consumption for the EV, everything is clustered in between uh, 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 five in the afternoon and uh, and eight in the in the evening. And the reason for that is because people come back home, they have a minimum charge level, plug it in and say, I want this charge to a minimum of 50% or 60%, so that I'm sure that I can get away from my house if if necessary. But what is very clear here for the Saturday is. Most likely, most of these cars have been well charged and not used very much on, the, on the Saturday. And here we can actually see that we can manage to, to move all the, the load uh, here uh, from this time span in, in the after, uh, uh, early evening after, uh, or evening. Uh, so we can actually move that away from the, from the peak. So what have you learned out there? First of all, we have learned that we should never underestimate the, the, the users. And I think that Mike uh, Hansen uh, from DTU's uh, talk yesterday also showed that. Uh, when we started out with this, we had an idea, or all the people out there had a vision that they were very flexible. But we must also realize that the closer we get to, to reality, people tend to be less and less uh, flexible. So it, when they have these tools where they can set their the, the, these bars where they can set their, their comfort levels, they tend to creep up in the beginning. So we only run this for, for uh, a little more than a month. We hope that we can negotiate some of the flexibility uh, up a little so that they uh, will turn down their, their, uh, their comfort settings so that we have a little more elastics uh, in that. Uh, to, uh, to work with the, with the users, you really have to respect uh, their, uh, what, what they say. We have some users that need to go to work. They definitely, they're working in, in night shifts, so they cannot participate in, in, a, in, a, in a test like this. And you really have to respect that, otherwise uh, thing will, things will uh, uh, go very wrong in an ex experiment like this. We can see that the, the EVs and the uh, heat pumps more than doubles the, the load on the grid just in this short period, and we are not, not even in the winter yet, so we look forward to see what is going to happen in, in January and February when we are, uh, are going to see how, uh, how uh, the consumption on the, on the heat pumps is and 
during that period. We also see that the flexibility is there. Uh, it might be hard to get, but it is actually there, and we can uh, shift the load around uh, to some extent. And the, then another thing that we have learned on this project is, of course, that uh, we have built a, a live lab with a hell of a lot of equipment and different devices. And, uh, and of course, we are struggling keeping this afloat, as you also saw with all the red houses. Uh, when you do this, one thing is very, very crucial, and that is you need to keep this simple if you're going to if you're going to succeed in, in, in this. Also, not only for your own sake, but also for the end user's uh, sake, so that they don't get confused and, and can't help you when, when they are needed. Our next step in this process is to start up on, on uh, heat pumps. We know that's going to be a hell of a lot more difficult. Uh, and there's a, that's, we regard this as a, a very, very big uh, challenge. But uh, we have to test it. Now we have the the live lab, so we are going to test it and see what happens. The iPower demonstration, yes, that is uh, the springboard to this afternoon's uh, session. Uh, where do we fit in? Uh, this is more or less the, the outline of the, the, the whole uh, FLEC participant panel, panels of participants, and, uh, and uh, we are currently maybe too dominant <laughs> on this, I don't know, but that's the way it is right now. We have built our aggregator platform, we have our live lab down here, and with Sasego, or now Kampstrup, we have uh, been discussing these, uh, how, to, how to deal with these user comfort settings uh, for, for quite a period now. As uh, both David and uh, yeah, some of your other guys also showed, uh, we are dealing with, with five different uh, uh, management, load management services, and what we are going to see today is this uh, Power Max. I'm not going to use much time on that. We have built a simple aggregator, and we are able uh, right now to, to monitor and, and uh, uh, handle all these data from, from a lot of, of uh, devices and uh, a lot of equipment. We uh, have given the, the end users in, a, in households an option to, to uh, choose uh, some comfort settings and also to choose some uh, control settings if they want to a green profile or if they want a, a more uh, price or economic uh, profile. And uh, currently we are running tests on, on this uh, uh, peak load management service uh, and it's been running uh, for, we started one and a half months ago and it's been running on and off but we are trying now to, to stabilize it and, and have a long period where we can where we can see how this really affects the, both uh, uh, the people out there, but also how we can use it in, in reality. Next is, of course, the ancillary service market, maybe not from, uh, from, the, from the EVs, but uh, we have some ideas regarding, regarding some of, of these services. And also the intraday market where we see there's a potential, maybe not in Denmark at the moment, but then uh, in the, our neighboring countries, uh, there might be a good potential for, for delivering services like this to, to a balanced responsible party. Next step in the horizon is smart cities. And uh, uh, currently, we are looking to see if we can make some microgrid stuff for small communities as well. But uh, it's, it's in the future. I brought with me a small brochure that you are welcome to, to to get, you can just come over to me. I have a small brochure regarding this uh, peak load manager uh, service. And uh, come by if you're interested in, in that. And do we have time? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Aye, they good. <laughs> now, now it's time to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, in zero, as I said, uh, the Insero company is, uh, is uh, based in, in Horsens. It is a, a outcome of, uh, of a, 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 a company uh, uh, fusion between, uh, between two uh, DSOs in, in the area, the old NRDE 
in RGI, it must be in, in English, uh, the local uh, DSO in, in the Aarhus area and uh, uh, the, the local uh, DSO in uh, the Horsens area. And uh, when they merged, uh, there was a lot of money left over in a, in a, in a venture fund, and uh, that is actually what is the prime uh, uh, focus for, for the Encero company. So we have a lot of venture capital, which we invest locally, primarily locally, uh, in a lot of different companies, not necessarily uh, related to energy, but also to, to medical services and stuff like that. Uh, these are the different uh, subsidiaries of of a uh, of a uh, Encero, uh, and uh, I'm based down here in Encero Software. But we have a whole suite of uh, of uh, companies uh, in the Encero portfolio. And I actually think that is all I want to say now. So if you have some questions, please. Questions for Thomas and for the uh, interesting live lab in Stenrup? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation, and you showed really the interaction with the end users. I liked your, your presentation of, of the Friday and uh, to Saturday. <laughs> Because it was quite interesting to see that the electric vehicles, it seems like they were actually connected to the grid uh, during the whole night. So people didn't have to use them, didn't have a need. No. But they, yeah. So have you tried to, to, to work on, on different uh, initiatives in, in, or motivation uh, so, so you could try to learn them that, well, you, you don't have to connect them to the grid or the system doesn't have to charge before, after you've gone to bed? We, have, we haven't done that, done that yet, but it is definitely the next step because we can see that they, they set their <coughs> comfort limits very, very tight, so that there's nearly non-flexibility uh, in, the, in the electric vehicles. So that will be the next step, to teach them that this is not dangerous. You can do this. We guarantee that your uh, electric vehicle is charged by tomorrow morning when you have said that it should be ready at 6.30 or 5.30 or whatever. Uh, so that is definitely the next step uh, in this. We have a sociologist connected to this project as well, and she is uh, uh, in close contact with, with all the, the users. And that is really needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Anas Birgitong Energy. Uh, I have two questions. One is related to the driving in electrical vehicles. Do you have any data on how the actual driving pattern is related to the charging behavior of the uh, owners of the EVs? Uh, and whether they actually need the charging uh, they, they do in real life. And another question is uh, the local distribution grid in Stenerup. Since you've applied so many uh, of the future equipment, was the local already existing grid uh, challenged by that in any way? Did you have to reinforce it or, yeah? Well, it's always uh, easier to get a uh, salvation right than, uh, <laughs> than a, 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 a permission, yeah. Thanks, Eva. Uh, so, so, no, we haven't asked, actually, to, to answer your first question uh, first. Of course, uh, energy has been a part of this uh, in the shadows or in the vicinity of the, of the projects throughout the, our, our build-up of the, of the village, and uh, we have not enforced uh, the grid. Uh, luckily, these, uh, these uh, uh, houses are not on the same radial. They are on different radials out there, so, so that helps a lot. Uh, but should we start again and set up 20 uh, houses with equipment like this, I think it is worth giving a second thought <laughs> if, you do, if that is really really the way to... to uh, depend on what you're going to test, of course. If you're going to test the grid, that'll be the way to do it. And your first question was... I've forgotten. Whether you uh, know anything about... Yeah, the, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have not looked into that, to that, to, into that. We have a, a 
company called eMobility who is looking into studies where they are trying to track people around. Uh, we are also tracking these vehicles. We have a, a data logger in them that tracks the vehicle so that we can actually see where people are, uh, which is a whole different story. And, uh, but we can track them around and we can see how their patterns are when they, when they do, uh, their daily patterns are. And 99% and of anything is from home to work and back again. That is the primary, and you, you know that from yourself. You don't need to have a, an electric vehicle to, <laughs> to know that. Uh, so, so that's, a, that's a, the main use of, of the vehicles. Most of these people out here, they have actually two vehicles. They have their old uh, uh, car, which is, of course, a, a, a gasoline or diesel-driven car, and then they have received this. And in the beginning, there was some skepticism against this car, but actually they are using them quite a lot. And some of the, the people out there have actually decided to sell their original car uh, for this period and then uh, see what happens when the period is, is over. Um, uh, but we are, uh, we are making a study in a related project where we are trying to see how is, uh, uh, how is the behavior of the, of the, of the EV users actually. Uh, hi, Anna from DDU. I want to ask about the red houses. It's, uh, it, you have some problem with connection or you don't get some of the data, is that correct? Oh, the bad houses? The red, I, yeah. They, I don't want to talk about them. Oh, please, <laughs> but it's, no. I think it's a very interesting issue because... Um, uh, no, I will. It, uh, I want to ask, yeah. connected to the red houses, yeah. is there any control inside of the house? I mean, in case you lose the no. connection to the house? No, okay. no, no. No. So and, and that is, of course, an issue. If you want to roll this out into the real world, you might need to have something that a schedule lying, lying locally in the house for each, <laughs> each of the houses. Uh, Even in order to guarantee that you actually charge the yeah. car? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Thomas. Uh, I'm happy that you could um, kind of confirm my, my idea about the <laughs> peak loads. <laughs> that was nice. Um, I can see that you are a bit early now with uh, trying to move around with the energies. Have you figured, have you thought about if you somehow could show your, your customers that uh, actually by allowing you to move around with the energy, they could uh, do some savings if you compare with the um, L-spot prices? No, no, we haven't actually. Uh, and that was, a, that was a good idea, yeah, to try to feed that back into the users to see how they react now that they actually can see that uh, this is working and uh, it has an effect on both the grid and uh, on, the, on, the, on the, yeah, the, their econ economy. So, that, yeah, that would be a great idea. There are no more questions. Good. Then uh, we'll thank Thomas for his presentation and then pick. <laughs> okay. Now we have the luxury of being ahead of schedule, and the next uh, point on, on the agenda actually has to run on schedule, which means that now we have. Uh, some time that we would like, uh, uh, we would offer you the possibility of visiting uh, other parts of uh, our experimental facility, namely the Flex House, which is just out here, so you can actually see what is being controlled later in the, in the demonstration. So, uh, those of you who are interested in doing that can go and have a look at that, and for everybody else, we will reconvene here at 20 past three. So, please.
So we are finally come to the last demonstration for this uh, event. So I give the floor to Esteban and his friends. Yes, all right. Um, this is the last demo of, the, of this session. And uh, I know you're all tired, but uh, I think we will try to make it as fun as possible for you guys too. First of all, the presentation is called Acquiring Distribution System Services through the FLEC. All right? So we're already setting the scenario there. This is going to be about FLEC and how we trade with FLEC. I'm here representing DTU, uh, as well as Anna Stavlo over there. Lift your hand, please. There. Then we have Ole Sundström from IBM, there. And uh, Carsten Soy from Inzero Software, there. They will be helping me during the presentation, pushing the right buttons, uh, you know, all the implementation stuff. That's those guys. <laughs> all right, so let's start off by talking, where are we now? I would like you all to imagine yourself jumping three months into the past. That's why we have that date over there. All right, we're 19th of <laughs> August, 2014. I am a DSO right now, and I'm planning ahead the reinforcement for the grid and so on, and I see that at a certain moment, there will be a congestion issue in, uh, in one of my uh, feeders or one of my transformers or whichever element. So I can always choose between two things, reinforce or acquire flexibility. Now, how can I acquire flexibility? That would be through the FLEC that provides uh, the acquisition of flexibility services is this interface between aggregator and DSO. Who do we have available on our grid right now as aggregators? We only know of, of two. We know of DTU CE aggregator. Again, Anna's there. And we know of Insero Software aggregator, Carsten over there. So the congestion problem we see is that, let's suppose it's a transformer, that uh, we want to keep the load below 175 kilowatt. All right, because we want to have the rest of the, of the transformer as uh, a reserve in case of the, a fault in a neighboring <coughs> transformer so we can split out the, the power there. So, as it is now, our prediction says that we will go 8 kilowatt above this 175 limit we have. Now, as a real DSO that we have a few around here, I know that 8 kilowatt probably is nothing. But just for the sake of argument, please follow me. So let's recap a bit about FLEC. In this presentation, we are focusing on uh, four of the main aspects we believe uh, why FLEC is important. First of all, it's a standardized method for acquiring flexibility. Second of all, it provides a transparent way of transferring this flexibility. That means that we can see quite clearly who is bidding uh, and so on, so there's no favoritism. Again, bear with me this time because today our DSO and our aggregator for DTU is actually Anna, so he's working for both companies and has insider knowledge of both things, but uh, this is just for the demo. Uh, it uh, facilitates visibility of the service need towards those who can actually provide the service. So that means that uh, the DSO posts on FLEC, hey, I need this amount of uh, reduction, can anybody please supply me? And then all the available aggregators on that uh, area will say, yes, I can, or no, I can't, or I can provide this much. And finally, it provides a clear legal framework. So what happens if one of the aggregators uh, go bankrupt, and, and, and uh, what happens if one of the aggregators doesn't perform as expected, and all this settlement part. Um, you can see the interaction will be like this. We have the DSO talking to the FLEC operator. FLEC operator today is Ole. The DSO is Anas. Then we have two aggregators, Carsten and Anas again. And one of these aggregators will be controlling a unit down here at the distribution level. Today's unit will be the Flex House that some of you just saw. Uh, some other of you have seen pictures of it uh, earlier in, uh, in the event. I think yesterday Oliver presented some pictures of it. Um, so this is the, the setup we'll see. 
Now, we will show each of these four phases that you usually see in, uh, in the power system. We will start off with the planning phase, uh, showing the acquisition of the flexibility service. We will go on quickly through the scheduling phase. This is not really relevant for us, and then I'll explain why. Then the operation phase, there you will see some real stuff going on. Uh, you will see some numbers changing over here. You will see, uh, well, you won't see, but the flex house will start actuating. That will be reflected here. And then finally the settlement phase. Throughout all of this, we will have these two screens helping me along. So if you feel lost at any moment, this uh, part here will tell you where we are in the process. If you feel completely lost, then in the folders you got yesterday, there's also a this same diagram so that you can follow what's going on there. And this window is actually a flag window. So this one will be showing when there's open a market, uh, when it's receiving messages of uh, bids, when it's clearing, and so on and so forth. Uh, all this uh, first part is usually automated, but today we actually press a button. So we've implemented a button to go through the phases. And when I say we, I mean Ole. Um, so it's almost a final product, except for these small changes we've done for the demo sake. So this is also running on, on a cloud service somewhere. Um, and then that is communicating between uh, the two aggregators here, and uh, the two aggregators are then communicating out to SysLab. So we have some complex interaction here with regards to communication, which goes out in the world and then back in. That is assuming that the cloud platform is not running somewhere here in Copenhagen or something, but I don't think so. All right. So we start out by, by the tender announcement. So there's a bit of data here. First of all, it's the market period. So in, in which period is the market open for the aggregators to bid in? So this is today. Remember that we are in August today. Uh, so only for today, this market will be open. When is the reservation period? When does it need to perform? That will be three months from now, the 19th of November, 2014. So yeah, we have invented some uh, you know, time travel technology, so don't worry. You won't uh, start to get gray hair or lose it like me. Uh, ac the activation period is denoted here. This is uh, the period where the aggregator will perform, and then the volume that it needs to downregulate um, or upregulate if you're actually talking as a service. Uh, I will go into these details later on, but in order to get the whole thing rolling, I will pass the word to Anas so that he can show you how he makes the tender announcement from the DSO perspective. Yes, so now you have to envision yourself like a really, really nice uh, DSO interface to Flick. So this is what we came up with. It's <laughs> probably not as nice as, as it could be, but uh, for demonstration's sake, it, it will work. So here you see the numbers that uh, Esteban just introduced. So we have the market period, which is today in August. We have a reservation period, which is uh, today, which is convenient for this presentation. We have the activation period, which starts in 15 minutes. And then we have a maximum price that the DSO is willing to pay. We use this to, uh, to uh, um, clear the market. So if we have aggregator spits that is above this value, we can kind of clear them out because they're not relevant for the DSO. Uh, yeah, I should mention that this uh, cost that the DSO is willing to pay is not forwarded to the aggregator. So this is some knowledge that stays with Fleck. And then finally, we have the uh, power reduction that we request. And here we have the areas or, or point of deliveries, uh, the SUSLAP and the INSEO, the two aggregators that we want to control. Well, let's so, point out that it's actually the two areas that we want to control, not necessarily aggregators. No, that's could, entities yeah. in, in the grid, in distribution grid. So what we will do now is that we will uh, submit this tender, which will go into Fleck. So, <laughs> so now Fleck registered this market. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
actually you can see that there's a bit already. Uh, that's because uh, in SEO, uh, bits into the market automatically. So uh, in SEO, received the message and uh, replied to it. So may maybe I should, uh, yeah, maybe, do you want Ali to introduce? Okay, so, so what we will do now is go to, uh, to the SUSLAB aggregator interface, which is nice and smooth, like the other one. <laughs> so now we are sitting on the other side of the table, playing aggregator. So here we have registered that this market has been opened. Fleck has sent a notification to us. And we can see some uh, parameters for the market. So we have the market period. We have an activation period and a daily activation period. So, so the way it's conceived, I think Isabel will go into to this later, that you have an activation period which goes over some months, say, and then you have a daily activation period. So every day within the, the activation period, you have a activation. But today, it will only be once. And the SUSLAB uh, and in SEO bidding areas. And yeah, luckily we are in the, the SUSLAB bidding area. And here we can specify the volume that we are able to regulate down and the power max, that's the, the maximum value of uh, kilowatts that we will consume. And finally, we have a price. So I will submit this tender now, which should be registered by Fleck. So, so now we can see the second offer here in the Fleck interface. So uh, yeah, we actually, so I'll just go here. So now we will go to uh, the, the clearing phase. So oh, we have three computers over here trying to yeah. keep track of. So what we can do now in Fleck is that we can actually clear the market. And just this would have happened automatically at the closing of the market period uh, if we had the real thing running. But again, for the sake of the demonstration, we decided to put these buttons in case we were a bit behind schedule or ahead schedule. Uh, another detail here you can see, I mean, you can already guess who's going to win this bid. Right? I mean, we can see the prices there. <laughs> uh, if Syslab won, then we would be using the dump load that's right behind this screen, which is just a set of big uh, hair dryers, like this size. And this would, if, if Anas had won today, we would all be very, very warm in about 10 minutes. So that's why I, I asked him, please, please uh, don't win the bid. So in, in the Nordic power market on North Pole, so, so you kind of, you activate the cheapest bit first. And that is the definition of this market, specific market. There are other services that could be handled differently, uh, maybe a first order, first served. Uh, we've chosen to follow this, which is common also in the primary frequency, no, in the manual regulating power market. Um, This is the internal of the aggregator. Uh, do you mean over here? You have to click in on the offer in order to, to, to see this two kilowatt. Actually, uh, go into detail. Not now. OK. No, no, OK. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you will see it. Uh, it, it turns out okay. in, in the settlement. It's used for the settlement. Um, have you cleared? No. So for okay. we will clear the market. So, so, yeah, I think Ole should explain now what is going on with, with these plots that we presented. Sure. Maybe we can zoom in on one. <coughs> so what you see now is that there's some rules to this uh, market, which is that you have to provide full delivery after one minute. And you see the green area, which is where the aggregator has to be during delivery. You also see that uh, Fleck gathered meter data, um, historical meter data, for a period similar, similar like this. Um, and this is the gray, gray line. And this is used to calculate this uh, predicted baseline for this offer. So this is what we see. And later on, after the settlement, we will also see the, the real measurement uh, for the 
winning bid. Yeah. One of the reasons we see um, this uh, prediction here is we're discussing a lot. Of how do we know when the aggregator bits in saying I can go from 10 to 2, that's difference of 8? How do we know that's actually what they would have used? Uh, it's uh, somebody, uh, some people call it the baseline problem. It's maybe not exactly that, but we, through discussion with Silas and David from Dansk Energy and with Lars Henrik from Dong Energy and so on, we agreed upon this solution where the FLEC receives historical data and contains uh, some forecasting methods where it says, well, if you had uh, performed as you would usually have done, yes, indeed, you would have gone from 10 to, to 2, or you, you would have been up at, at 10. And so the 10 to 2 is this 8 kilowatt reduction that you promised. So I validate your bid, and therefore, it's accepted in the market. So that, that is the reason for, for this timeline to be there. Um, can you give me back yeah, there? I, I think we should go back to the aggregate of Indu, yes. uh, win window, as you can see here. Our offer was rejected, which we planned to be, luckily. So that means the, the Inseo won. So I think it's time to introduce the Inseo user interface. And I think Cast will talk a bit about what is being presented here. Well, as you can see on the screen, um, we've received a PowerMax open notification as at the bottom. Um, right after that, um, the, uh, the client provided a offer of um, volume of eight and a max power of two in the area called in zero. Uh, and no, no. and um, <clears throat> with a price of 400. And as soon as um, they pushed on the clear button, uh, we received a PowerMax offer. No, sorry. After we sent the offer, we get a, a, an offer acknowledgement <clears throat> from Fleck telling the system that uh, our offer has been received. Yes. And as soon as they, uh, they clear, uh, Fleck clears the market. Um, we uh, because we won the bid, we received a contract. and. The system responded to that contract telling uh, Fleck that we have received the contract and accepted it. Yes. All right. So we will go on to the scheduling phase now. So this means that we're going to run in time. We're going to jump. And uh, there you go. Time is running so, so, so fast uh, that you won't imagine. Uh, the reason why we don't touch much about the scheduling phase is because this is an internal thing of the aggregator. Some aggregators, uh, like predictive aggregators, will probably uh, do some scheduling around there. But uh, some other aggregators, like we've seen PowerMatch, for example, or the, the aggregator that Giuseppe presented yesterday, they only take real-time data and the, and the moment, and they don't use predictions in order to plan. So they wouldn't need this scheduling phase. They would just perform at the moment they, the series starts, right? Uh, in this case, we have a, a kind of, uh, of uh, service or aggregator that doesn't require a scaling phase either. It will just send out the signal to the flex house, and it will perform. So that is what's going on now, I think. Um, has the message been sent? No. So what okay. we will do now is we, we we are now in the current time, so it's time to actually fulfill this contract that Inseo uh, received. So what we will do now from Fleck is that we uh, activate, if I can find the mouse cursor here somewhere. So what we will do is that we activate, uh, activate the winning bit. And this is actually more of a reminder, Fleck saying, hey, remember that you actually won this contract. So I think Carsten should explain yes. what's... Yes, as you can see at, at the top, we received a PowerMax activation notification, which uh, translates into the system sending uh, the value to FlexHouse um, with the PowerMax. And it will run out, as you can see in, in the debug window at the bottom. It'll last for 30 minutes, and then it will release the FlexHouse again. So maybe I should just... Um 
uh, put your attention to the dashboard over here, so you can see uh, that the service has been activated, and uh, right now FlexHouse has actually decreased its consumption to 800, 800 watts. And uh, yeah, actually you will be able to follow along with the temperature, which would uh, decrease during the, the activation period, because we don't consume as much power as we are supposed to, or what would be ideal for, for the heating of the house. So for this next 30 minutes, uh, the, the temperature should decline mm. under normal circumstances. But nothing is normal here, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we're a bit ahead of schedule. We, this should have been started at 1545, as it was specified. Um, but then again, that's part of the whole demo thing where we can force things to go. So we you will, don't have to wait here. We will run for half an hour. as, yes. as so that means, if you give me back the presentation, that I have half an hour to practice my stand-up comedy. Um, I hope you have a sense of humor, because I don't. No. Uh, I'll talk about two things now, actually. First of all, I will go a bit more into detail about what the PowerMax service is. And then I will talk about these three numbers that we see here that I could not convince Anas to force to, to become something, but I'll explain why in a short while. So first of all, of all the PowerMax service. <laughs> this was described in the technical report called FLEC PowerMax Service Requirement Specification. And maybe I should also inject here that a second technical report regarding uh, the FLEC API, so to speak, uh, the protocols, was also made by Ole. Uh, this one was made by, well, a bunch of people together. It was Annas, uh, Lars Henrik, David and Silas and Henrik. No, you were not part of that one. Me, I was part of that one. Um, so all the nitty gritty details and, and, and thorough explanations are in this technical report that should be published very soon in uh, D2 Orbit. Um, so to explain what the PowerMax is, the purpose of the PowerMax is to maintain the controllable load within a certain area beneath a limit during a certain period of time. So I think we've been seeing this for several times now during the last two days. Here's a schematic of what's going on. We can see that at one moment, a transformer will go up in what is usually reserved for a, for a reserve operation. Uh, and we want actually to reduce this load. Since we cannot control, control the green curve, which is the base load, we take the two controllable curves here and press those down, as you can see here, maybe if I move a bit, as you can see down here. So we will assign a new limit to the controllable load on the grid. I could not resist putting some equations up there. I mean, I know it's late in the day, but I'll explain what's going on here. We're using, using the usual notation for forecast here, or estimate, which is a hat notation and the bar notation to design a maximum. So the need of the DSO is this, is the following. That the estimate of the maximum base load, or the peak base load, if you want to call it that, plus the estimate of the peak controllable load should be reduced with some delta power, with some volume, such that the overall load or the, uh, the uh, peak load of the system uh, is respected. So that the, the piece is, is what we see down here, right? The question for the DSO how is how do we define this delta P? How, how do we actually make a tender, for, formulate a tender such that this delta P makes sense for us? Um, this is done the following way. The delta P that the DSO formulates for the tender is composed of two elements. Let's start with the second one first. This is the risk associated with the inaccuracies in the forecasts of the controllable load and the base load. You can see here these are forecasts and then the risk associated to that, plus what it expects the different aggregators will bid in as a volume reduction. Again, we have the hat representing uh, an expectation or a, a forecast. Which aggregators are we talking about? Well, these aggregators are a subset of all aggregators on the grid 
that are able to bid in. So that's what this denotes. Again, this is explained very much in this technical report. But I think it makes sense to, to explain it with equations, even though it's late in the day, because I think it makes it clear. So once the DSO has formulated this delta P, it goes on to formulate the tender. Now, the, as we saw before, the tender must contain the amount of power reduction from the expected consumption, so that is the delta P DSO that we just defined, a list of point of deliveries. What we saw over here, the point of deliveries was the point of delivery called SUSLAB and the point of delivery called INSERO. Um, then a maximum price to accept, that's something Anas mentioned before. It was, I think, a thousand crowns uh, in our tender before. This, again, is only for the FLEC to, in order to do the, the clearing of the market. If no aggregator bids in below that price, it will say that the market was not uh, successful, and then the DSO can reopen a market. And then the aggregators will see, ah, okay, we bid too high. Let's bid again a bit lower. Then the time variables for the service provision. And those are the ones that were discussed before also. Which months uh, and days the service is to be delivered? Uh, it could be the case that we see that we have a congestion on the grid every weekday during the months of December and January and February, for example, due to the new resistive uh, heat uh, in, in houses, for example, or due to new technology or new factory being uh, built under the radial something like that. So you're specifying which months and, 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 and days. Uh, as it is right now, we assume every day, but this could be only weekdays, it could be only Wednesdays when you know that there's a specific factory that produces a batch, for example. Uh, then you say between which hours should the service delivery run? So today it was 15.45 to 15, uh, not to 4.15. And uh, then what Ole mentioned, this green space here, from the start of the service, how long should it take before the, it's actually performing? So this is more in detail what this PowerMax service is. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. I would like to take some questions now. No? So it's clear what the PowerMax service is. All right. Um, we have some assumptions with regards to, to how this is set up. And uh, I know maybe some DSOs here or some other people will say, oh, that sounds completely unreasonable. We found out that these were probably the most reasonable assumptions that we could, that we could uh, define. First of all, that the DSO is able to separate the total load into a controllable and a base load. So that is what we saw before with the, with, with the equation, that there's a base load and control load, and it's actually able to do forecasts on these two. Uh, this means that the DSO needs to have enough grid measurements to do these accurate load forecasts. And with regards to the risk, that the DSO is responsible for the risk of continued congestion whenever it's actually uh, uh, not estimating these uh, base load and controllable load accurately. So maybe it asks for eight kilowatts, and that's actually what the aggregator uh, delivered, but, uh, but it didn't help his congestion issue. Well, it's his own fault because he didn't estimate correctly how much he actually needed. So having defined that, I'm going to be a bit shameless, and I'm going to plug in my own research now. I mean, we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes still to run, I think. So um, if we look right now what's going on here, we can see that it's still performing below the two kilowatt. The temperature has uh, not really fallen, so that means that it's actually able to, to keep it. Uh, I should mention that the comfort band here is between 19 and 23. So that is, uh, it's staying more or less in the middle, so that's nice. Uh, and now I'm gonna explain what these three numbers are that it's a shame we, we don't get any numbers here right now, but I, I, I'm going to explain why we don't get any numbers. This work was presented at ISGT 2014 in Turkey in the month of October. Uh, the paper was called Performance Assessment of Aggregation Control Services for Demand Response. The authors are me and Giuseppe around there. 
uh, Kai, who's also there, and Henrik, who's also here. So we're all here. Um, what we're looking at is if we have this setup where an aggregator is delivering services to either a DSO or a TSO or BRP, whatever, and at the same time delivering services to a set of DR units, how do we evaluate the performance of this aggregator? Uh, the idea behind this is that we could, in theory, by measuring the performance, then doing, uh, during our tests in the laboratory, say, this aggregator performs very well, so this one is uh, actually uh, accepted to perform out in the, in the market, or this aggregator is not very good, so maybe some parts of the algorithm should be reworked and, and so on. So that's uh, a bit the idea behind this. How do we do this? I can see there's a wrong title there, sorry. Um, what we usually do, I come from control engineering, so what we use, usually do in control engineering is we make some kind of performance index based upon some kind of performance uh, criteria. Uh, there are a load of these ones, and these are only the, 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 the ones that uh, don't take stochasticity into account. You also have the Harris index, and I don't know what, a bunch of other stuff. I decided to, to stick to the old school stuff and, 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 and look into integral square error in order to measure the quality and the reliability of the aggregators. So, um, oh, how do we do this? First of all, we need to model the services. This drawing that you see here is the green drawing that you see over here, actually. This is where the aggregator is allowed to perform Usually there's a definition of the service where it says it has a, a band where it, it can have a certain amount of error. In the PowerMax service, as it's defined in, in by the IPAR VP 3.8 technical report, it says it's 5%. Uh, and uh, it has 15 minutes to deliver when, uh, when it's uh, on our basis. Today, it was only one minute. Um, we model everything that's in between this uh, red, red line and the black line as an error that's acceptable and everything above the red line as an error that's unacceptable. So what we do is we say the quality of service is the error that we have. So that is whatever is below the, above the, the black line. And we scale it to the constraint or we scale it to the limit, allowable limit of the service, which in this case, is the red line you saw before. In this way, the quality of service is a number between zero and one, such that zero is a good service, means you have no error. One is a very bad service because you are approaching the limit. Above one, you're not performing at all. Then we plug this into a quality metric. This is the integral square error, or the two norm, if you want to if you're a mathematician, this is the Euclidean norm. If you're a control engineer, the integral square error. Of the asset management service, that is the, what's uh, being controlled in the house, for example, this could be staying uh, between the, a bandwidth, uh, comfort band. And this is the ancillary service, uh, quality of service, that is not going over a, a certain limit in this case. And then we integrate over time and take the square root of these two squares. So this gives you uh, uh, an idea of how the aggregator is performing over a long period of time. What we want to do is we want to normalize this metric by the maximum it could have achieved over time in such, such sense that we are normalizing with time, really. In this way, again, we get an eta that has a value between zero and one, one being very bad, zero being very good. And the reliability is measured by saying, if I go above, my quality of service goes above one, then I update a counter that's saying, oh, there was one time, two times, three times, and you didn't deliver, you have to pay. This comes from the fact that this is uh, the way how the services are defined nowadays. We could envision a way of defining the services such that as long as their reliability index is below one, so that we also normalize this with time, then it's an acceptable service. So this is work that's going on, and, and uh, we hope that the DSOs uh, would see this in the future as an acceptable solution. 
we performed a case study where we took a centralized model predictive control architecture versus a distributed model predictive control architecture. Uh, this solution has been presented in another paper by Giuseppe Costanzo in ICGT 2013. And the idea is that the model predictive controllers are uh, coordinate, coordinating themselves through a blackboard. I won't go much into detail. If you have questions, you can ask uh, at the end of this part. Um, the base case is that we have four, 40 households. We have 20 large EVs. We have 10 small EVs, five uh, PVs. And then we have some uncertainty in the system reflected in the solar power production. So we can see that we want to keep uh, the, the load below 150 here. So we're going to cap off all these peaks we have here. Uh, and therefore, we implement this uh, MPC controller. The results are as following. Having a 10% and a 20% uncertainty on the solar production, you can see we get different numbers down here. It's clear then that the uncertainty affects the performance of the aggregator. Now, you may say, well, those numbers are very small. They are so close to zero. I mean, does it matter at all? I mean, this, we could round up, and then it would be zero anyway. Well, of course, this happens because we are working on a simulated environment. So uh, there won't be communication issues. There won't be any other uncertainty apart from the solar irradiation. So this will look very, very nice, as we can actually see here. I mean, it, it respects very nicely the, the power max limit set here. We hope that by doing further tests in the laboratory, these numbers will get closer to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Actually, yesterday night, when we were testing this setup, it was going on here. The problem now is that the house reacted faster than I expected. It actually performed very well, and I was telling Anas the whole time, no, it's going to fail, the, the transceiver is not going to send the right signals, and don't worry, we're going to see some error tomorrow. It's impossible that there's not going to be any error. I have been proven wrong, um, which is both good and bad. Good for in zero, because then they can say, hey, we have a great aggregator. Bad for me, because then I just have pure zeros there. Um, so at the same time, you can see that we did some simulation tests over several time horizons where we can see that uh, independent of the day, the, the magnitude of these numbers remains more or less the same. So that is, if we have a very large error in a service that's supposed to deliver only for half an hour, then this uh, magnitude will be, well, it will be a very large number, close to one, or maybe even above one. But if you have this large error in the beginning of a service that's supposed to go on for three weeks, and it's the only error, then it doesn't matter much in the whole, in the big scheme of things, right? So, why did that one? Okay, this is part of uh, my ongoing PhD work, which is uh, looking into uh, how to define all these service requirements and, 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 and uh, scenario description and so on in order to do pre-qualification tests on aggregators so that we can certify them. Once they've been syslab tested, we can say, this aggregator is actually able to go out and perform in the industry, perform in the market. Uh, we see this as, as a service we can deliver to aggregators. Uh, well, we, I just showed you then was this part down here, which is a verification and evaluation of the aggregators. Um, this part in here, it's a, a coordinated effort that we've been working on uh, in, in our lab, integrating the power system, DR units, uh, communication, and the aggregator in such a way that they are plug-in uh, capable so that we can say we use the actual power system we have in, in, in SysLab, we have some real DR units, we have some simulated DR units, we have a real ICT platform, or we have a simulated ICT platform, and then we have the aggregator, so that we can uh, work with either pure simulation or with hardware in the loop. So that is the idea behind this part. So are there any questions with regards to this?
I can hear Søren Østergaard commenting something there. Yeah, but there, there is some heating. This corresponds to, I think it's one or two, it's probably two heaters, this one, um, that's been activated. And we're, here we're taking the average of the temperature of the, what, seven, eight rooms. So some of the rooms might be a bit colder, some of the rooms might be a bit warmer. Uh, we decided that just showing the average was more fruitful. Um, yeah, so that, that is why we just see it marginally rising, keeping, keeping the temperature. Maybe I can just comment on that. Um, first of all, there might be a, a thermal momentum in the system, which will actually take some time before uh, the, 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 the temperature uh, decreases, because you have some energy in the, the space heaters, which are made of metal. Uh, second, when we planned this demo, we didn't expect it to be 15 degrees outside, so normally, the consumption will be much higher, but could be that uh, two kilowatt is actually enough for Flex House on a day like this. So even though we're only spending 1.8 kilowatt, we are actually still heating the house up. So, so that could be a, but, but yeah, it yep. should be declining slowly, I think. We'll <laughs> yes. Okay. Will you be in common details with the verification process later on? Because Actually, I'm, very, I'm very curious, because now yeah. you have asked for 30 minutes, 8 kilowatt down, but 8 kilowatt from what? Maybe he has bought a second machine in the meantime, and he's doing nothing wrong, and he is above your 10 kilowatts or above mm -hmm. your 2 kilowatts. Um, how, how do we want to handle that? Yes, that is, uh, I don't think we're going to go much more into detail further on, so I'm going back to explain that. Uh, that came from, no, I can't find it. Uh, yes, here. The fact that we have some estimate here and the deflect requires a historical data and the deflect contains a set of algorithms to predict what would have happened. So it's actually Fleck here who decides, yes, you performed or you, no, you didn't perform. And, Yes, 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 yes. I, I see you're surprised. Um, the reason is this. Uh, when you, you enter a contract with Flick, you have an agreement on which method to use in order to pr do the forecasts. Um, when your bid is acknowledged and, and, and uh, been validated and entered into market, it means that Flick agrees that when, you are, when you're stating in your bid that you're going down from 10 kilowatt to two kilowatt, that that is indeed what you would have used. And yes. Actually, you're actually you're limiting the customer in two ways. You're telling him you must behave like you did a year ago, and then on top of that, you'll have to drop eight kilowatts. Not necessarily that he must behave. It's rather that we are we were working on estimates here. We're, we're not forcing him to, we, if he doesn't win this bid, he can perform as whatever he wants. He doesn't need to, to follow that curve that he would have followed last year or that he followed last year. Suppose he wins. He would probably have something similar, yes, because it's historical data and it's uh, uh, based upon predictions. Um, Suppose his base load is now without your regulation. 12 kilowatts. He has done nothing wrong. He has just bought a second machine. Yes, that, that, that is what we say then, that the DSO must be responsible of the risk of a, f, uh, of a failure in the forecast of the controllable load. I can see that Ole has also come to that one. So I think this is related to this baseline computation. Yeah. And uh, you could imagine that the baseline is computed on a few different days. So taking the day before delivery and the day um, one year ago, and then computing the baseline for the settlement. So we're showing one, one version of this, and there's still ongoing research about what is the, uh, a useful algorithm and what, what data this should be based on. Okay. 
Actually, you touched on the point that was a larger di discussion while working on these technical reports. And like, how would you calculate the baseline? And we kept on running our heads against the wall because of this exact issue. Uh, we know that in the US, they've gone over to work on uh, schedules. So they say, like uh, one week ahead, they say, this is what I will be using. And then you can trust very much on this one because they, they, they are bound to that one. Son, you had a question? Yeah. comment on, on the other question, that the baseline is definitely an, an open research topic and uh, we don't have a clear answer how to generate it. But you could also see it the other way around because luckily it's a pretty warm day today, so it's pretty easy to, for the aggregator to fulfill this power max. Actually, maybe he doesn't have to do anything, but it could also be the other way around. So who takes this responsibility? Um, that's still open for, for discussion. So I think, so let's talk about all. Yeah, okay, so, so uh, the Energy Flex House have to, uh, the services uh, it delivers is uh, max 2 kilowatt watt yes. hour, but uh, DSO needs 8 kilowatt hour. No, no, no. Decrease. The DSO needs to decrease 8. Yeah. yeah. So that means that the, the Flex House expected to use 10. Yeah. And what they've done is they've bid in this 8 to go down to two, uh, a maximum of two. Yeah, but then now the DSO have a problem because I uh, saw that just before switching off, it was 3.4. So it's only two of the eight uh, kilowatt hour the DSO actually Yes, but we're, we're also saying it's the peak value. It's the peak value that we look in. If we had continued for 15 yes, minutes more, it might have been up at the at Yes, the but, but the, if the DSO actually needs the eight kilowatt, then the DSO had to get six from out elsewhere because FlexHouse yes. is only delivering we two. But, but it's the same problem. It's the same baseline problem because it was only delivering... Or yeah, the, but this, this is three. only the baseline for the FlexHouse. But the, the rest of the grid still needs six more. We don't know that. No, no, but, but they, no. They, uh, they anticipated <laughs> that. Yeah. If I can just pick up this question, I mean, we forecasted that, that FlexHouse would consume 10, and that's what the DSO based its estimate on. And compared to that, we did downregulate eight, 8 kilowatt. But the observant one, maybe that was what you said before, we were actually consuming 3.5. So actually, Esteban did prove me wrong that it wouldn't be perfect. And we have okay, had yeah. some problems with actuators in FlexHouse, and I think we will see that in the settlement phase, that we, we didn't fully deliver. We actually did consume 3.4, I think, uh, kilowatt yeah. in an instant of, of time. I think Anna has a question in the back, or maybe a comment. Hi. Um, so uh, let's assume that this aggregator would work every Wednesday in the evening when people are coming back from home. And then this data would be put back to FLEC, and then FLEC would assume that every Wednesday we would have a data that uh, this house doesn't consume anything. So after some time, in a few months, yes. it would notice that, oh, actually, I don't have this problem anymore according to my prediction because the house was not consuming on that day and then it will not order this uh, service again. So how that, would you... That is it? exactly what happened in the US and that's why they went on to work on these operational schedules because once you start messing around over a long period of time with, with the, the flexible demand, then you cannot predict really anymore because you don't have historical data. Um, I mean, an option would be also, instead of using data from a year before, uh, base your forecast only on the meteorological data, for example, where you say, we can see that a storm is coming or that the temperature is going down, so we know that, generally speaking, when the temperature goes this much down, the load will increase this much and then operate maybe not on a uh, very specific forecast, but on rules of thumb saying, when we have this uh, temperature, we should probably ask for this much service. Uh, I think that goes a bit more with how the DSOs operate today r using these rule of thumbs. Um, oh, actually, the house has been released now because we were in the, uh, yeah, we've had half an hour to burn off now and you didn't even need to hear me tell jokes. That was nice. I think uh, Lassia yeah. has a question or maybe a comment. Mm, 
more a comment. Um, what you touch upon is uh, the fact that we are using uh, these uh, DER units, which are more or less stochastic. So uh, when we start to operate them, is uh, their behavior due to uh, uh, control or just because they are out there and now they want to be utilized? So um, the, the issue you touch upon here is not only a, a flag problem. You would have the same if you go to the ancillary service uh, uh, delivery <laughs> that um, if you provide something for the TSO, uh, you need to prove afterwards if the TSO requires it that you have uh, delivered the, the, the service, kind of. And, and you touch upon a problem here that is <coughs> difficult uh, to, to show whether the behavior was that due to active control or just a stochastic phenomenon. All right, I think one last question and then we go on to the settlement. Very much the same, uh, along the same line. How do they in the U.S. prevent the aggregator from behaving malicious, you know, creating artificial overloads? That is an answer I don't know. I mean, my guess is that you uh, have to work on regulation in that aspect. Maybe we can pass the microphone on to someone yeah, so really working with knows, markets. Yeah. So, yeah. Silas? Yeah, well, in the U.S. it has actually caused quite huge problems and also lawsuits on yeah, manipulative behavior on baseline because they base it on like three uh, max load days out of five and uh, then you can actually go in and pick the days that you would like to be in and out and choose the high days and get a high baseline and et, et cetera. So it has actually caused huge problems and that's also why it's, it's still a, a, an area of, of heavy research actually that goes into this. And as we understand, they start to work on those like um, operational schedules for, for at least for the larger consumers. Um, to, to deal that, with that issue and, and there of course you take some risk on whether you estimate uh, the, the actual load uh, right but you avoid the manipulative behavior by the, from the aggregators. But obviously there's not a, a, a very clear and, and, uh, answer to it yet. Yeah. I think we will go on to the settlement uh, in order to not keep you here longer than you need to. So that means that the flag operator, and well, for some reason, it's not Ole pushing the button, but it's actually Anas doing it. Uh, he will say <laughs> settle, and yeah, I need to go forward here. As you can see on the dashboard, we have uh, exited the, the activation period, so now Flex House is actually allowed to consume whatever it wants, and now we increase the consumption again to eight kilowatts trying to get back to the 21 degrees which we had before. So that's why the, the consumption increased r quite rapidly. So now we can let the flick do the settlement. Uh, let me just put, push the right button. So I think may maybe Olle can uh, speak a bit about, I will try to extend the plot here. So, uh. so what you see is that right now everything happened very quickly and you you see that uh, we got the meter data from, uh, from the DSO showing that uh, Incero actually almost delivered all the time, except for one, one, uh, one minute there. And uh, even though they didn't deliver, Fleck accepted this as full delivery. And uh, an invoice was sent to the DSO and payments to, to Incero. So, do you have yeah. anything to... Yeah, I just want to add that these payments, they're not real payments, because if we had to pay for every time we ran a test in the last few weeks, <laughs> D2 would be poor now. Um, I think that is what I, there is to say about the, the verification that we, or the settlement that we haven't touched upon before. Again, it's all this issue, is it actually respecting or doing what it would have uh, going down from, from the 10 peak and so on? It's an open question, but uh, we've done the, the settlement this way. Yeah, maybe we can just have a quick look back at the aggregator uh, window and the DSO window. So if we take the DSO uh, first. So here, we actually um, did uh, get a request here. So that the market with this market ID that we created earlier this morning has been finalized and uh, the aggregator actually delivered. 
So we get a notification for paying the $400 uh, dollars or euros or whatever amount of money to uh, Inseo for, for the service they delivered. And I think, hopefully, likewise, we can see in uh, Inseo's window. Uh, yeah, maybe Carsten, you can uh, present that you did receive. Or maybe you did not. You didn't receive. <laughs> we can see here that they released the Flex House once again when the service was finished. Okay. Well, Inseo should have received a payment message stating that they, uh, they have to get $400 euros or whatever from the Suslab DSO for finalizing the service. No. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they don't want the money enough, so... No, because the, the messages appear in the top, the new messages, so, so it should have appeared in the top. Anyway, let's go back to the, to the presentation. Um, what can we say about what we just saw? We saw two things, roughly speaking that the maximum peak of the control load, in this case, was reduced uh, to two kilowatt, almost. We had a hiccup there. Uh, and this would, in turn, have alleviated the, the, the congestion issue. Um, looking back, what we've shown is, uh, we went through the planning phase where we stated the, the problem of the DSO and then and, uh, and how they would acquire a service, they formulate the tender, send it to Fleck, uh, get bits back from aggregators, doing the clearing, uh, so on and so forth. We've uh, been through the operation phase, which is where I burned off half an hour here talking to you. And finally here, the last part of the settlement. Now this shows three main points about Fleck. One is that we've uh, managed to work on the standard communication, which is described in the technical report done by Ole. So that was one of the first uh, points, or one of the main points that we wanted to, uh, w why we wanted Flick is we want to standardize communication between aggregate and DSO. The second point is it was transparent. We could see out here in the Flick clearly who was bidding, so on and so forth. So there is no risk of anybody cheating and, 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 and getting ahead of the queue. And uh, we have the visibility for potential suppliers. Whoever is registered with a Fleck, they will get the notification if there is an open market within their area. The last point, the fourth point, which was about the legal terms, I don't put that one here because we didn't talk that much about it in the presentation itself. I think it came on with the questions. Um, but uh, I mean, it's clear also that it, Fleck being a market operator serves as an economic and legal liaison between the DSO and the aggregators. So, any more questions? Yes, Giuseppe? Thank you. Uh, we see now that the Flex House is released from the service and is consuming 7.7 .7 kilowatts clearly showing that the um, external conditions require some consumption in order to deliver service for the users, let's say, which is in terms of temperature. How this, if this is fed back to the, to the aggregator, does the aggregator know how the user is feeling because of this power max? And if not, do you think it would be possible to in, in, yeah, insert this in FLEC and extend this framework? Well, that's not part of FLEC. FLEC okay. doesn't care about the user. That's why there's an aggregator there. The aggregator is the one that's responsible of taking everything that's related to the end customer, to the user, putting a screen in front of that, and then just showing the service towards the DSO. And that, that's why FLEC is there. With regards to the feedback to the aggregator, well, you would have to ask the people from Inzero if they actually receive feedback from, from the users. Uh, in the case of, of the Syslab aggregator that we have, yes, we would be able to measure what's going on. Um, and I expect that most aggregators will do some kind of closed loop control in that sense. Again, take the question up with the people from Inzero. Kai has a question? 
Well, uh, let me allow to start up with a follow-up comment. Um, there is actually the customer performance indication on that oh, presentation as well. You didn't have a chance to get into this because this hasn't been part of the service specification you presented. Um, but there's, so there is a, in terms of evaluation or validation of the aggregator, you need to look at both ends. Where the, what the customer experience is and what the power, uh, what the service for the DSO experience is. Um, and Fleck is not responsible for what the customers experience. Mm -hmm. So I would like to turn that into a question basically to Encero. Um, would you care to have such indexes um, that allow you to um, have a sort of dashboard experience of, of the customer? Or um, do you think you would use other means of uh, evaluating customer performance sort of on the fly? Um, so I would like to turn that into a discussion here. Yeah. We have Thomas here. I don't know if I'm being mean I by pointing at him. I think Thomas will try to, to answer that question. <laughs> well, here we are dealing with a, with a house and some temperatures before we were dealing with, with some vehicles and uh, some electrical batteries. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to have a dashboard for for all customers in a, in a village like Stenerup, for instance, where we should monitor if they feel, feel good about what we're doing uh, online and, and, and track that every day. I don't think that it's going to be the case. Uh, I think we will... <coughs> we could aggregate it, yeah, yeah, we could use the... Uh, of course, you could use the temperature out there to some extent. Uh, but this, the question is if it will be used, and, and I doubt that uh, actually. Uh, if we had, say, 20 houses or 30 houses or 100 houses, would we use that for, for monitoring the, the comfort of many, many office buildings or many houses uh, on the fly? I doubt it no. will be used. I doubt. Yes. But when do you send the money? So we so wait for the phone call when they're having a cold shower. Um, Okay. In that case, you will be waiting for the for the call, yeah. 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 The aggregators. Um, if you have, let's say, a pool of customers, say 100 or 200, and you place a bid on the flag market, so how would you divide? the power max, let's say, to each customer in order to achieve that bid? Uh, how would you divide this service among the customers? Because the customers have different needs and probably some families are not even at home, so you can actually reduce much more in some houses and less in others and generate a, gen have a general ex customer experience that is good, actually. Uh, so. That, that would be, uh, it's my first guess, if you, would be possible if you have some sort of feedback from customers and use that in order to do, uh, optimize the, the signal you send them in order to control the systems at lower level. Do you want to answer to that one? Uh, Thomas, it's down here. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what we have decided to do is to, to give the, the end user some comfort bands that they can use. Say, I want the temperature be, to be between these two levels. Uh, and as such, we, we don't care if they are home or if they are not at home, and we don't monitor that at, at all. Uh, and and uh, there could be several reasons for that. <laughs> Us monitoring that might not be uh, wanted by, by the end user uh, at all. The, you, you can actually see a lot from from uh, from uh, the the, uh, the house power's uh, consumption already, and knowing if they're home it might not be uh, interesting for them. Uh, so so I think you should turn it around and say give the user some some comfort settings, uh, and uh, and let the user be able to to control these settings on a daily basis or whatever, uh, and then make sure that you steer between these comfort settings as an aggregator. And if you're outside the band, or outside the limit, you'll be absolutely sure that the, the customer will call you or the end user will call you and say, hey, there's something wrong here. Uh, 
and or maybe you will, they will not call, but but adjust their settings so that they, they their flexibility, uh, yeah, is, is set to zero essentially. So so that's what I think we will see instead. We will not uh, wait for them, uh, or, or communicate them with them on a daily basis or whatever to hear if, if they are okay. So it will be something with with a comfort setting that they can use, uh, and, and that way can communicate with the aggregator. Okay. I have a question then for the DSO, if I may. We have been showing, uh, well, I showed in, in the, during the presentation, this concept of, of stamping an aggregator with a performance and saying this is validate or this is an aggregator that, that is able to perform in the market. Would it help the DSO or the DSO's uh, you know, um, uh, worries if they knew that there was such a scheme that the, the aggregators participating in the market were certified before actually entering the market? You were thinking of fine. Okay, so if they don't perform, they pay money. Exactly. Yeah. So they, you wouldn't be interested in, 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 in having this kind of stamp no, for you. It's, no. it's a legal agreement and uh, yeah. okay. uh, trust is good but it control is better okay. and punishment <laughs> even better. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, this is something we have discussed a lot um, with the VP5 and um, yeah, uh, my, my immediate uh, response would be the same as you just gave. Uh, but uh, I think we have discussed it a lot and I think we, we do not want to go down this track because we will scare off uh, the aggregators. Nobody wants to take this big risk if they know there's a fi big fine out uh, at the end. And of course, uh, they should not enter a contract unless they know that they could provide. Um, so I think that, that could be an answer to you. Now that we have uh, DSOs uh, in the room, uh, could I take the, uh, the chance here to ask a, a qu uh, actually two questions? Um, do you think that, um, can you see, do you have challenges in your grid that could be solved by a smart grid method? And could you see yourself uh, solving this uh, uh, problem uh, with a marketplace as a flag? Well, I'm not the CEO, so <laughs> I'm just an engineer. But I, I think the example with the transformer is a very bad one. I, I think you were, okay. you were thinking of a 10 kV transformer, yes. and we just take off the lid, and for no money take a, second, uh, take a spare transformer, and the input is one side lar larger, no problem, no money, nothing, no problem. So maybe if it's a feeder and it's in winter time, that's for actually for a very short period, maybe for a year or something like that, when we can't get in the ground. Uh, and of course, if you have it on a lot of problems, the problem will move to higher levels, and then we can't just exchange the transformers. Then there might be a problem, but that's in a very long time. Maybe, yeah. 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 Uh, not coming from a DSO, but working for a lot of them. Well, uh, I think it's very important to see smart grid solution as a as a part of the solution. Sometimes you have to reinforce the grid. And, and smart grid solution will be used if they're economic feasible. So, so you should really see if, the, if as, as Morten mentioned, if to change a transformer, well, there you can use the small ones you, you exchange at another place in the grid. But if you have one kilometer of, of underground cable, well, you don't take it up and, and dig it down again. So in some areas, well, smart grid solution are economic feasible. In others, well, changing equipment. You should, again, you should look to the age of e equipment. If you have some equipment creating a bottleneck, but at the end of the lifetime, well, you know you have to, to ex exchange it in, in the coming years. So, so it's a part of the solution. In some areas you will see grid, grid, grid reinforcements, and that's not a, a, a bad thing. That's also a part of the solution. But it should always be economic uh, competitive to traditional grid reinforcements. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, today we are reinforcing the grid uh, due to uh, embedded generation. So it's uh, actually shedding embedded generation that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, maybe of course you could increase load, but I think that's a, a drop from one. So it's more shedding uh, embedded yeah. generation, I think. 
Are there any other questions? If not, I will pass on the microphone to Henrik, and I think he will close off. Yeah. Which one do you want to use? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the demo. That was very nice. Thank you for all the demos. I think it, it has been very nice to see that PhD students can implement stuff and get things to work. It's a very nice experience. <laughs> uh, I know that it has taken a, a lot of effort to, to get to this point, but I think what you have done today and yesterday was actually uh, very good and very worthwhile. And I think it's it, uh, also, you, you can see from the discussion here, that it makes the discussions much more concrete when you have something that is actually working and, and you have some very particular issues that you can discuss that are not just uh, uh, some more abstract concepts that uh, you can continue discussing forever. So I think that is very good. So thank you for your efforts uh, doing this. Yeah. So. Um, there's somebody else that should be thanked uh, and that's all those people that have made all this work because it has been, uh, it has been some effort to turn Syslab into a, a conference venue. That, that is not really what we intended it to be originally. So I think uh, we should also thank all the people that have prepared everything food and chairs and screens and sound and so because they have really been fighting for it to make it uh, a nice event so please thank all those <laughs> and and uh, seen from iPower I think uh, this event here has shown that we are definitely in the phase where we are having results that we can present. We have a lot of interesting stuff that we can present now. We have had some very uh, nice presentations these, these days. And uh, I think it, it uh, also uh, shows great promise for the next two events that, that uh, we will have. The one in May, where we will also present results and there will be new results, a lot of them. So you should Keep looking in your inbox when we are sending you invitations there because I think it will also be worthwhile to attend that. And then in a year, there will be yet another event with even more new results, so you should also consider that. So remember that. And I think it's also uh, another very nice thing with ice power, uh, I power, I should have known <laughs> by now, uh, is that uh, that we are actually putting a lot of emphasis on implementation. And I hope that that will also uh, sort of be in the spirit of the project where innovation is a, a very key element of it so that we are not just doing the simulations, but we're actually taking stuff further. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, after this presentation, after the uh, other uh, presentations that we have had, that uh, we can continue working with this. And for instance, we will have a, a real flick operation in a real power system so we can see if the concept will actually work when stuff gets real. So uh, we will at least work on that to see if that can, can happen. So uh, that is one of the sort of the goals after iPower. So I think with that, uh, I will thank you for coming here. Uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed being here. It has been a pleasure having you here. So uh, I hope you will, I will see you again soon and uh, have a safe trip back. Thank you. <laughs>